Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting for January 9th. May I have a motion to go into closed session? Pursuant to the General's Provision Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move we go into closed session to consider matters that relate to the negotiations, to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction to consult with counsel and to perform an administrative function. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to go into closed session for all the reasons said there. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Aye. Ms. Morset? Aye. I have three in favor. Motion carried. Okay, we're going into uh, closed session. We'll see you at 6 p.m. Good evening and welcome to Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting for January the 9th. This is a public meeting that is being videotaped for county citizens to review on QAC TV 7, a local cable station. The agenda is available on the uh, information table over there. During the meeting, we ask that you turn off your cell phones and hold personal con conversations outside the meeting room. We will now stand to, be, to uh, take the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm asking when you finish the pledge, if you would remain standing for, um, for a moment of silence for our troops and first responders that are away from home and in harm's way. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. I need the uh, approval of the agenda. I make a motion to uh, remove 9.05 policy for approval and to add a closed session to the end of our meeting. We have a motion to remove item 9.05 from our agenda and include another closed session after the meeting here. Do I have a second? Do I have a second on the motion? Second. Discussion. Okay. Yes. The discussion. motion is second. Um, discussion. Yeah, I'd like to speak to my motion, please. The policy for approval is the policy development policy number 110. I believe that we are not prepared at this time to discuss this. I think there's some changes need to be made before we put it out for the final uh, approval, and we need to add a closed session as we didn't finish in our previous closed session. And I'll just add that that also includes the regulation, 110.1, uh, uh, I believe it is, and the editing conventional convention document that was attached to it as well, all need to be discussed. Okay, we have a motion. Any more discussion? Well, and it needs to be discussed in either a work session or here, Fine. or be put on the agenda, table it here, and put on the agenda for the future. Okay. Agreed. It's an open session discussion item. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. So we have an uh, amendment to the agenda to um, move the policy for approval um, into, take it off of today's agenda and and uh, table it for another discussion in open session and the regulation and table that for open session. We also have part of that amendment to the agenda to continue the closed session following the open session. So we will take a vote. So we're going back into open and to close after yes, we finish we are, our open yes, session. Yes, and we are taking a vote on the amendment to the agenda. Ms. Harp, Ms. Are we going to vote all them together? Or vote them all together, all together yes. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Uh, Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Aye. Ms. Harlow? We're voting on the regulation, the policy, and the closed session together? Yes. yes. This is to mm -hmm. amend the agenda. Mm -hmm. So, so all of that that was for policy goes The back. policy and the closed session separate, but I'll say yes. Ms. 
Zach? Yes. Ms. O'Connor? Absent. I'm absent. Okay. I have four in your firm Okay. The amendment to the agenda passes. Now I'd like approval of the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. Any discussion? No. Well, members, please if I would not call your name. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Hopper? Aye. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Lissette? Yes. I call your firm. Okay, the agenda is approved. Now I need a motion to approve the minutes from December 5th and December 19th, both closed and open sessions. So moved. Second. We have an amendment and a second. Any questions or any discussion? Okay. Well, then, Ms. Fulton, I want to call your name. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Aye. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Lissette? Yes. Ms. Connor is absent. I have four of the affirmative. The motion is carried. The motion is carried. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Lee. Minutes are approved. Dr. Kane. Okay, we have some very special uh, recognitions tonight. So if you would join me down front. Hot in here. Good evening, everyone. It is so good to see all of you here. We said, we, like I said, we have a few very special recognitions tonight. Um, and I'm going to start with the very first one, which is the Energizer Bunny Award. So I'm going to ask if our partners from Bayview Financial would come forward, Mr. Brittingham and Mr. Humphreys. Please come forward. Yeah, and the bunny, exactly. So tonight's Energizer Bunny Award, this award is given to the staff member or volunteer who keeps on going. The award is sponsored by Bayview Financial through Chip Brittingham, Wayne Humphreys, and Mark Humphreys. And tonight's recipient of the Energizer Bunny Award goes to Mr. Dave Brown, our very own supervisor of accountability. Mr. Brown, won't you please come forward? Mr. Brown was nominated both inside the, uh, the board with members inside the Board of Education by Ms. Derry, uh, Debbie Terry, accountability specialist here, as well as Nancy Krim, the teacher specialist at Bayside Elementary School. In the words of Ms. Terry, Mr. Dave Brown is an employee who truly deserves recognition for his work over the past year and for the past 10 years. He's an excellent team leader who is highly respected by all supervisors, central office staff, school administration, and all of our staff. Most of all, he is highly respected by his own accountability team. That's the greatest, that's the greatest honor. Mr. Brown supports us and gives us the tools needed to do our job, whether it is attending an outside conference with important information on providing useful database uh, bases that he created, or uh, just the work that he does every day with the useful work that he does each day. He consistently has our back, this is from Ms. Terry, and is always ready to reward our efforts with praise or a lunch out. <laughs> Mr. Brown always makes time for anyone who needs his attention. Through all of our incredibly stressful testing times, he always tries to stay upbeat, to look for positive outcomes, or in difficult circumstances, Mr. Brown looks for compromises and always focuses on the good. Mr. Brown has tackled <coughs> testing in all areas with confidence and determination. Th though he makes it looks effortless, effortless, he's spent countless hours learning protocols and guidelines inside and out. His vast knowledge of state and local testing is well past comprehension. He knows the information intimately. 
Mr. Brown stays on top of the constant changes and information related to testing, making him a priceless asset to Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And as a personal note, Mr. Brown, I just want to thank you as well for ushering me in and bringing me back up to speed while I have been in Maryland for a number of years. I left Maryland for three years and I had a bit of a learning curve when I came back to bring because Common Core and all those things came while I was gone. So you brought me up to speed and always did it with a smile on your face and, and entertained all of my questions just really to help me understand what had transpired over the time that I left. So thank you from all of us who, first of all, let's talk about who's here with you. My wife is here with me. Okay, so we're going to come on forward. <laughs> Debbie and Nancy and any other teacher specialists who are depend on for everything. I see Dina there. So come on forward. If you're here to support Mr. Brown, I'm going to ask you to come forward. We're all going to squeeze in this picture, and we're going to make sure that he gets it. And we want to be sure that you're in the photo. So please come forward. Dave. And Dave. Great things are always happening. Oh. <laughs> Do you want to say something? No, just, just, we always end with, and great things are happening in Queen Anne's County. I'd just like to give Ms. Krim an opportunity to say a few words. I just wanted to speak on behalf of the teacher specialist because Dave is so important to our job. He is the most upbeat, positive man that I've ever met. He's always available for us. He gives us his cell phone. He tells us to call us anytime, call him anytime during testing. I have called him many, many times during testing out in the hallway on my cell phone in a panic and he's always calm under pressure. Dave is amazing and we appreciate what you do so much. We're going to miss you so much, but we do have one more testing season with him. <laughs> so thank you, Dave, on behalf of all the teacher specialists for all that you do for us. Mr. Brown's not leaving right now. He's going to be here for a few months. Okay. The next award is our Shining Star Award. And this award recognizes the Queen Anne's County Public School support person who shines. Tonight's recipient of the Shining Star Award is Ms. Vicki Farrell, Bayside Elementary School's math tutor. Ms. Farrell, would you please come forward? <laughs> Farrell, thank you. Ms. <laughs> Farrell was nominated by her principal, Louisa Welch, and the Bayside Elementary School Instructional Leadership Team. Here's what they had to say about Ms. Farrell. Ms. Vicki Farrell is a shining star at Bayside Elementary. She's our dedicated math teacher, tutor, and even though she's a five-hour employee, Ms. Farrell frequently stays well beyond her work day. Ms. Farrell is a self-starter who willingly, willingly completes tasks not only related to her math duties, but assists the teachers and office staff in any way that she can. She shows the initiative to provide support to classroom teachers and to students. She displays excellent judgment and is always diplomatic and professional. She's a positive role model and is well-loved at Bayside Elementary School. Congratulations for being the shining star to everyone at Bayside. And do you have uh, friends here with you today? Please come forward, and I know your principal is here.
And our final award for this evening is the Queen Anne's County Public Schools Spirit Award. This award recognizes an employee who is enthusiastic about his or her job and our school system. Tonight we honor Ms. Robin Scherer, third grade teacher at Bayside Elementary School. Ms. Scherer, please come forward. Ms. Scherer was nominated by her principal, Louisa Welch, and the Bayside Elementary School Instructional Leadership Team. And here's what they had to say about Ms. Scherer. Ms. Robin Scherer truly exemplifies the Spirit Award as she exudes enthusiasm on a regular basis. Ms. Scherer has a sunny personality and she's always smiling just like she is now. <laughs> she is her student's biggest cheerleader, and of course she shows concern for her students' academics, but she also carefully nurtures their social and emotional needs. Ms. Cher graciously shares and communicates her gratitude for all things big and small by taking the time to acknowledge the efforts of others. Ms. Cher has been our school's sponsor for the Student Council for many years, and this is where she truly shines. She spends countless hours organizing student council projects and meets with the student representatives and officers during her planning time. Her emphasis on community service projects enables students to experience the pride and satisfaction of helping others. This year's Feed a Family Food Drive was the biggest ever, resulting in over 3,000 cans and boxes donated to help our neighbors. Other projects she's brought to the school include Cookies for Courage, Letters for Senior Citizens and Senior Center, The Mitten Tree, and donations for the Animal Welfare League. She's also a big promoter of Bayside Elementary School Spirit, planning special spirit days for the students and staff, and the Bayside Elementary School staff sincerely thanks you for your exemplary spirit. Thank you, Ms. Sharon. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Looks like some folks stayed back. Um, well, um, that was great. Uh, I wanted to, uh, we're going to move into the next item, which is community involvement. The first thing on there is the board involvement summary. I just wanted to let the public understand that um, our board members don't just attend meetings once or twice here in front of you each month, but there are many events that, that we all go to or try to go to, and they happen day and night. It's important that you all understand the types of things we do 
Uh, but so, but instead of going from member to member, because it's not really a competition, every member on this board does as much as they can, um, in around wh what they have to do and their responsibilities in other areas. So, uh, I just think what we'll do from now on in this area, we will call up um, an opportunity for anyone of the five board members to speak on something that was especially um, I interesting to you or really enjoyable. And it's something that maybe the public would like you to would like to know that, that we have actually done. So I was just started on. I always usually do um, a legislative because I'm on the legislative committee for the Maryland Association of Boards of Ed. Um, and I just want to bring out two key items. The Maryland um, Assembly begins their activities today. If you haven't read the papers, many bills are coming forward, and uh, the Maryland Association of Boards of Ed are called. It's called MABE. They're going to represent all 24 school districts like they do every year with the main goals that we have. The primary goals every year are to be uh, watch out for any bills that will take away the local governance of the school boards themselves and any that result in unfund unfunded mandates. That's something we always fight to avoid at, this, at the assembly. Um, and the other thing is on February 21st is the annual legislative luncheon at the State House. And any board members that would be able to attend, it would be great. It's a chance for our board members to actually meet at lunch and sit with our delegation, our state delegations, our state delegates. Um, and uh, and uh, I'll give more on that later, but that's on February 21st. It's a daytime <coughs> event, which is hard for some that work, but it's a real good uh, event to try to go to if we can. And uh, if we get enough turnout, I will actually talk to the delegates and see if they would join us. Um, this is just a couple hours event at an, in Annapolis at the State House. Does anyone have anything that was um, good this year or this uh, month, memorable this month? I, I would just like to point out um, Challenge Day <coughs> in December. I didn't know if Mr. Pluski or Dr. Kane was going to bring that oh, up. Right, you're going to bring a little louder. Um, uh, I attended all but one and, and for just an hour is what we were allowed. Uh, I have to tell you what a positive atmosphere. Uh, I've talked to some parents I've talked to my neighborhood uh, students um, some administrators and just what a positive experience it was and and really hope that we can continue that program um, it was amazing it really it truly was it was it was heartfelt and I can't say enough that how wonderful it was excellent wonderful thank you Dr. Kane, you're next. Okay, so and, and thank you for that um, that uh, explanation, Captain Kelly, because we recognize that board members um, have jobs many times and uh, different things are going on. So all board <coughs> members cannot attend all events. So thank you for tag teaming the way that you do and and just ensuring. Uh, that we are represented by our, our school board. So thank you for that. Um, and it could be that every board member doesn't have a report out, if you will, every month, but it's just that we are in the community out and about. Um, and the same goes for our executive team. So we're, we're out and about. It hasn't been very long since our last meeting, but um, certainly I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Engel and, and all of the partners that he had. And I know Mr. P is going to, to mention it as well and echo Ms. Harper's um, recognition of Challenge Day because it certainly was a very, very successful time. And, and what's always important is that we don't let it be a one and done. So we want to continue the momentum and we want to continue the efforts. But I won't talk a whole lot about that because I know it will be spoken about uh, a little bit later. But in December, of course, we had our uh, Christmas parade here in Centerville. And I was happy to uh, join our two student board members, Ms. Teddy and Ms. Miles, for that. And also uh, Ms. Morissette was available for that. And we had our Teacher of the Year, Ms. Rhonda Moore. Uh, we had members of our executive team. We had Mr. Fister and we had Mr. Paluski. They were driving and making sure that our lights were done. <laughs> members of our, our, our wagon. Members of our uh, central office were able to, Renee Wolf and, and Debbie Terry, they decorated our, um, our trailer. And it was just really a, a real family affair. And so I just wanted to recognize everybody that had a part in that. So uh, thank you. And if I forgot to mention your name, I apologize. Um, also, we uh, visited, I visited in December Washington County um, along with um, Senator Hershey and um, our Commissioner Jack Wilson. There were several uh, um, 
administer or superintendents from the Eastern Shore, as well as uh, our Chamber of Commerce. We had um, Ms. Friday was there and several other folks were there. So we went there to look, take a look at their CTE program and or their career technology education program and see if there are things that we could pick up and bring back for ways that we might be able to partner with our local businesses uh, to ensure that our students are being prepared for the workforce. So that was a very good uh, visit and uh, just like to recognize Ms. Friday is here with us so um, not sure if she's going to speak on that later but um, that was a great visit and of course um, you know it, it's, it's just always a pleasure to, to be out and about and, and have a chance to talk with students and and that so those were some of the things that were going on and I just wanted to recognize everyone for that Mr. Paluski thank you Madam Superintendent I, I don't want to be redundant but uh, I Challenge Day, I know Mr. Angle, and there's a lot of individuals in our organization that part, played a part in that. And I think one thing that I remember from Mr. Angle was the amount of parent volunteers that came to support and participate in other schools. And I think that just speaks to, to our community. So I certainly uh, appreciate all that. Uh, I had the opportunity on December to attend our assistant superintendent retreat that we have every December. That was in uh, Baltimore County. Um, nature Center. Uh, most recently, you know, we have some great partners here in, in Queen Anne's County and, and most recently at a staff meeting at the Fire Academy, they hosted us uh, in kind, giving us some um, conference space to, to hold our meeting. I appreciate Mr. Jester and all the work that goes on out there um, and his recruitment efforts of, you know, that our, our program that we have in our Fire Academy, which is greater with the surrounding areas. Uh, last night, I had the opportunity on behalf of the executive team to attend the commissioner's meeting uh, and just to hear to, to keep us involved in what's going on with our community. Uh, myself, Dr. Kane, and uh, Mr. Tolley hosted um, the community college president, uh, Mr. Harper, uh, as well to talk about our efforts to continue uh, more pathways for students uh, in higher ed. So I thank you. Just one quick reminder of our budget survey is out on our website and we are seeking community input with regard to what you feel our budget priorities ought to be. That survey is going to be open until January 21st, so I just encourage everyone to please uh, take a look at our website and uh, participate in that survey. Thank you. Okay, student board members, Ms. Miles. Good afternoon, good evening, I should say. Um, for today, we have um, Queen Anne's County High School has been chosen for the NAEP assessment, which means National Assessment um, of Educational Progress. This will be February 6th. Um, 55 seniors have been picked to take this assessment. Um, our first semester is coming to a close very soon. Our finals are the 29th and the 30th of this month, and then I will have one more semester left until I graduate. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chesapeake College is now offering a Fundamentals of Oral Communications class at Queen Anne's County High School on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1 p.m., um, so that's cool. Um, and on February 17th and 18th, there will be a workshop called Youth Undoing Racism. Um, this workshop will be held at the Kennard Heritage <coughs> Center from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. on both days. Also, just to touch on a little bit of the challenge day that everyone has been talking about, I was fortunate enough to be chosen to participate in one um, last year as a junior, and I can tell you from a student's perspective, it was amazing. Um, everyone for that whole day kind of just set aside their differences and were genuinely there for each other. There were moments when we were crying, and I mean, I remember like hugging people I've never talked to before in my life, just comforting them, being there for them. So it's awesome, and I really hope that everyone will be able to experience that one day. So yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Teddy? Hi, everyone. My name is Marissa Teddy. I represent Kent Island High School. The National Honor Society's Good Deeds Subcommittee collected 277 coats in the month of November and then distributed them on December 21st, just in time for Christmas, to residents all over Queen Anne's County. Um, today is National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day, so many students supported our student resource officer, Officer Matson, by wearing blue, and the Good Deeds Subcommittee presented him with balloons and thank you cards. January 3rd is Scheduling Information Night, so we invite all rising 10th to, through 12th graders that can visit, it, visit department tables in the cafeteria for a chance to ask about courses and pathways. That's from 5.30 to 7 p.m., and then from 5.30 to 6.15 p.m., um, we will have a session for incoming freshmen in the auditorium, so we invite all incoming freshmen to come check that out. 
Park, HSA, Government, and Science Standard Testing is this month. Final exams will be January 29th and 30th, and school is closed January 21st for Martin Luther King Jr. Day, January 30th and 31st for Professional Development, and the second semester begins February 4th. Um, speaking on Challenge Day, I actually got to attend Stevensville Middle School's Challenge Day this month for, or last month for an hour, and um, I thought it opened up a lot of great discussion, so it was really nice to be there and to see the community really come together. Also, one more thing. We are very friendly about our little rivalry that we have going on between <laughs> King Island and Queen Anne's. And I must say, we do play them tomorrow in basketball, so you all should come out. Girls play first at 4.30 or 5, I think, and boys play following that. So that'll be a fun little outing for us. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> At Queen Anne's? Yes, at it. Queen Anne's. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much for that. Um, and and I, I do appreciate you all as, as student members attending something like a challenge day out there. You give us, we need that student perspective every time. And something like that is, is a big deal and it's great for like, like, um, like our, our staff to hear your, your opinions on it too. And that goes a long way for um, our understanding from a different angle. So thank you for that. Okay, community participation. For public comment, we ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Organizations are given five minutes. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item, an, I an agenda item that is expected to appear in the future, or a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are to be discussed at the bargaining table. This is not a proper venue to address specific student or employee stu personnel matters, especially those matters on legal appeal to the board. Comments and the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through the available channels. Citizen particip participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have any specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your questions at a later date. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens and name calling when offer your critique. The first person on uh, our list is Mr. Bob Friday. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Bob Friday. I'm the association executive for the Bay Area Association of Realtors, which represents about 400 realtors and realtor members here in Queen Anne, Kent, and Caroline County. So I want to throw that out first because I want to thank you all for your support and help with Adopt a Bear. Uh, Bay Area uh, is the honorary chair of Adopt a Bear. We did over a thousand children this year for Adopt a Bear. We collected. This was also the first year that we actually had collection boxes in the schools. Um, got a little confusing, I think, for some of the teachers and people in the schools, but all in all, it went very well and, uh, and we were able to get it collected and uh, get out to the children. We're going to be uh, holding a meeting in the next couple of weeks. We'll be looking for board input in that. As things are going to change this year for the qualifications to participate in Adopt a Bear, which could very well put the program in jeopardy. So, we're going to ask for some uh, some guidance and some thought process on how we can salvage save the program um, w with these changes that are coming through. And I'm going to leave it at that. The main reason that I'm here tonight, I signed up for, is because there's been a lot of mentioning of Challenge Day. Uh, I had the privilege of being a volunteer at two different challenge days this year. And I have to say that the program, I only can wish that that program had been around 50 years ago as I was a child from an abusive home and was severely bullied for the majority of my school years. Um, had that been the case, I think things would have been a lot different for me in the anxiety that I grew up with would have been significantly less uh, than it was. Being a, a volunteer with these children and watching what unfolded that day in both of these schools, and they were from very divergent backgrounds, the schools that I went to, um, it was just absolutely amazing. 
I know there were discussions about whether it should be at a seventh grade level. And I will say absolutely. And I strongly encourage the board to keep it at a seventh grade level. I think the seventh grade is so pivotal, pivotal for these children, that age, that transition, um, and the challenges that they find. And unfortunately, a lot of our children don't have communication lines at home anymore, if we ever did, really. But I think this really opens up an opportunity for these children. I saw some of these kids in my groups that were so hard when they walked in and were the first ones to completely lose it and give up their, their walls to share their thoughts and their feelings and their challenges far beyond what you would have done if you had just asked them to come in and let's have a chat. So on the board level, I, I want to encourage you to please keep this program going. I think it is more valuable than probably anything I've seen. We raised two children here in this county and through the school system, and, and I can't say enough. I know that one of the ex-board members was very, very publicly negative about this program. Um, and that's unfortunate because I don't think people should jump to conclusions before they know. So for any of you still on the board, if you have, if you have second thoughts about the program or it, you just don't think it may be right, I ask you to please become educated before you become opinionated because I think your children deserve it and that's who you're here to serve. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Mr. Brown. The next on the list is Mr. Richard McNeil. Good evening, my name is Richard McNeil and um, I'm here representing and making some comments from the retired educators or it's no longer retired educators, it's a retired school personnel and I will learn that by the end of the year. I promise. One, I want to welcome everybody to the to the new year. And um, I just gave uh, Sid some pins. If you want to distribute those for everybody, I think there's enough even for Jeff. Uh, as you get ready to start working on your budget, it's a good pen to keep in mind what we really need for everybody. That's a reminder. So use it for what it is. Thank you very much. Um, I want to notice that we had a very nice meeting in December. Uh, it was great for to see some of our members who are retired and have been retired. We had several folks there who were in their upper 80s and 90s who don't always get a chance to come out. But that's kind of a special, special luncheon meeting. And it was just a great time to see that. Um, we had two of our board members there, and we appreciate that and your support. <laughs> also want to give a big thanks to the Graysonville Elementary School uh, drummers who entertained us with uh, two musical performances and it, it was just great to see the little little folks come in uh, with their uh, drums which are nothing more than a big <coughs> big barrel and uh, they played exceptionally well so thank you for letting them come and we just had a great time with them and I think they enjoyed having lunch at a big restaurant <laughs> to, to see uh, elementary children at Fisherman's End all enjoying lunch. Um, that was exciting also for me. Anyway, I wasn't there the whole time. Um, we had uh, several members uh, of our, from our group did make it to the challenge day to support that and unfortunately I had already committed myself on two other things so I didn't make it and I thank uh, Mr. Engel for uh, reaching out at the last minute sort of but we got that worked out and uh, through again through our network we were able to send the message out and everything I heard back from them was just really positive uh, again so you know we've already heard about that. Um, I want to make sure I'm aware that many of you are getting our um, uh, um, our monthly uh, newsletters. Letters, mm -hmm. newsletters. Mm -hmm. If you are not, uh, if you could let Jackie know, and sometime, and I don't think uh, Miss O'Connor is. Uh, I haven't checked, but if you could let Jackie know, and I will get those different those names and so forth, 
if you're interested, we, we would like to uh, offer that, uh, that opportunity so that you know what we're doing. And, and again, I appreciate uh, uh, comments every once in a while from that. So we want to keep everybody up to date as to what our retirees are doing. Um, if you're if you're not aware of it, I was it was announced at the um, uh, winter concert at Queen Anne's that they had auditioned the choir had auditioned for a showcase in March, uh, and they were accepted. There was only nine schools accepted, uh, and I don't know a whole lot of the details, but I know that it's the first Saturday in March at Easton. And uh, but it was announced at the at the concert there that they had uh, presented their uh, tape, if you will. I think it's a CD more than a tape, but uh, they were they were one of the nine schools chosen to uh, uh, be in the showcase. And uh, again, I think that's just <coughs> really something that um, we need to let folks know what's going on on that. Um, I know that uh, you're in the midst of working on a budget, and, and I know that's well underway from past experience. Um, I'd like to just mention that um, the work that uh, Janet Pauls does with the mentors, uh, I enjoy uh, working with first and second year teachers. I think it's an excellent program. Personally, I think we've seen some great results from that, helping these first and second year teachers get off to a good start to help our students do the best they can. And in order for them to do the best we can, we have to make sure that the teachers are doing the best they can. So I, I just, again, put that out for uh, support for that, for that program. And I'd also just like to echo our thanks to Dave Brown. Uh, I was a principal of a middle school where he was teaching. Did a, he was a great teacher, doing a great job at that. Uh, as a high school principal, he kept me informed when he got over to this job, and I appreciate that. And, his presentations to the mentors to keep us up to date on the data and what's going on is just outstanding. And, uh, and, and um, if you've never seen a man who can do a spreadsheet that goes over four computer <laughs> screens, he's got it. It goes one right across the other. So thank you to Dave for all he's done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Next on our list is uh, Mrs. Karen Fields. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Karen Fields. I'm president of the Queen Anne County Education Association. And I'm here tonight to ask that you adopt the resolution that we submitted to support our county's educators and community members at the March for Our Schools to be held March 11, 2019 in Annapolis to encourage the governor and members of the General Assembly to adequately and equitably fund our public schools. We know from an independent analysis overseen by the state that Maryland schools are underfunded by almost $3 billion annually. As the state looks to address this issue and revise how our schools are funded, we want to make sure that Queen Anne's County <coughs> educators and residents can be involved and make sure our county gets its fair share of funding. It is important that legislators hear voices from our county so our schools and students get the support they need from the state. I think we can all agree that our current funding formula is broken and that it's going to take all of us to fix it together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Karen. And if, and if I might take just um, sure. 60 seconds of, of a liberty. Um, Mr. McNeil, if we could ask you to come back up front for just a moment. <laughs> Not quite. Um. You mentioned some um, involvement with our students, and we know that our retired school personnel are always out uh, supporting our students and, and our schools and our administrators and teachers. Our students wanted to show you some appreciation, you and the whole association wow. of school, retired school personnel, and they made some cards for, for you. 
So oh, these are students know. from uh, Graysonville Elementary School, Miss Kemp's class. We have Miss Fort's class at Centerville Elementary School, Mrs. McNeil and Mrs. Jacobs at uh, Sudlersville Elementary School, and Miss Deegan at uh, Churchill oh, Elementary wow. School. So they made wonderful cards, our students oh. did, oh. and they just wanted and signed them and, and oh. sent you some messages of love. They just wanted you to know oh. how much they appreciate you and all of our retired school personnel so mm -hmm. a bit of a surprise for you but thank you, thank you. Well, our members, I'm going to keep this a secret until uh, Jeff doesn't put it out. Um, but uh, we, thank you. we thank you. Um, we thank you. We thank well, you. Well, there's a lot of members that are very active, as you as you know, and we still, uh, I still consider this home. And you know, it visit, is. Visiting all the schools and so forth, and a lot of our members do too. But I'll be, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, so, thank you very well. much. All right. Yeah. The next on our list is Linda Friday. Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> uh, good evening. I wasn't prepared to speak, but I'm going to since Dr. King uh, made a, a few comments. Um, first, I want to invite all of you to our uh, breakfast next week, uh, the kickoff breakfast. It's going to be held at Annie's, Georgia, at 745. I would encourage you to come out. We actually have... Adam Tolley and uh, Commissioner Jack Wilson, who's going to talk about some of the things that we've been able to accomplish together as a team um, over the last year. We've done some really great things, and I know, Dr. Kane, you can really, uh, with your leadership, you have really supported us, and I just can't thank you enough for that. It's such an important uh, part of what we do, yeah. this community, and getting our businesses and, and all of our folks involved in what happens. We can't, our children won't have a job if we aren't preparing them for it and preparing them for a workforce that they will be effective in. Dr. Kane, so, you're sorry, taking that's up right. Friday's two I'm sorry, minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Mr. Pender. Take those 30 <laughs> seconds off. Clock, really. Okay, good. <laughs> um, but anyway, I just want to thank you for your, you're you welcome. and your team for all that you do. Um, Adam Tolley, I can't say enough about him. He's been very open uh, about everything that we've been able to do and accomplish. So if you come on next Thursday, you're going to hear a lot of what's happening. Some of the initiatives that we have going forward, uh, we are creating a new job where we have someone that will work between education and businesses to make um, have a better connection. So you'll hear about that next week. Uh, it's just really, really good stuff. And um, we did go to Washington County. It was an eye opener for all of us. Uh, it was nice to have four superintendents together at one time. Uh, we left Chesapeake College and. Uh, Chesapeake College is on board, so we, we just have a lot of great things happening um, and look forward to moving forward uh, with all of our initiatives. But thank you, because I know we couldn't do it without you and your support. So It's collaborative. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. The other thing on Challenge Day, I did volunteer for Challenge Day. It was an eye-opener. I didn't have enough. Um, I have a big heart, but I don't think I had enough emotions that could get me through another day, so I only did one day. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Brad Engel for all that he does because I know that sometimes the people in the background don't get credit, but Brad Engel has been just unbelievable um, and just keeping us motivated uh, in the community. So I'd like to thank him, too, for, for all that he does. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's important for the public to know that um, Ms. Friday is in charge of the Chamber of Commerce, so that's the uh, co cooperation and all the collaboration we do with the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Engel, thank you for Challenge Day. <coughs> okay, our presentations. Okay, so we have three presentations this evening. Um, we're going to start with a presentation that will be uh, done by Mr. Engel, as we have talked him up. We're going to be looking at goal four of the strategic plan. We're going to talk about attendance. We have uh, another one that's going to share information about our superintendent uh, monitoring visits of the schools. And then our third one will be an update from our curriculum audit.
Is it hot in here or is it just me? It's warm. <laughs> okay. And hot, hot like under these things. I need something cold. Always in cold. What a mistake. Good evening and a happy new year. Happy new year, um, sir. This uh, presentation will be an update on uh, goal four, but specifically talking about uh, student attendance and sort of the direction that the state and the, you know, the Queen Anne's County is moving. Um, looking at some trend data and have some conversations on what we can do to improve attendance. So if we look at goal four, part three, where it talks about 100% of our elementary schools will maintain a 95% or higher attendance rate, if we look at the trend data um, going back for the elementary school, the, this is broken down by elementary school uh, for the past four years. Uh, you can see the trends in the data and as I shared, the benchmark is 95%. So we, um, in some schools will go above and some will go below. Uh, you see last year there were some changes as well. And the goal for, for secondary schools was to maintain a 94% or higher attendance rate. And this is the trend data for the middle schools. And you can see there was a drop off uh, last year from the other year. So, so the data has been going up and down. And as I said, the benchmark is 94%. And at the high school, there was an increase in the attendance rate. Uh, last year. Can you, can you yep. any thoughts? Uh, have you ever brainstormed as to what the why is on these, in particular the middle school drop? Yeah, I, I think, you know, when you, when you look, you have to really look at each individual student, and then you have to look at, you know, the student attendance rate. So if the student has, if they are, you know, habitually truant, and they are missing a significant chunk of days, then you then you look at that student how can we get that child to school i mean overall typically i mean some years you'll have you know the flu will hit schools and then kids will but we haven't had it that hasn't really impacted this too much in, in prior years so i think generally if, if we look at the attendance i think it kind of remains steady but i think it's looking at those children in particular and and finding ways to help them um, coming up with attendance contracts meeting with them we have two ppws that will actually do home visits um and so every school has a has a student services team and they actually at the high school they meet every week and they talk about each student that they consider to be <coughs> at risk especially with with attendance um no I, d I don't have a magic formula you know we know that uh, you know student attendance is very critical and important and, and, it, and when a student starts missing school in middle school, they are telegraphing their intentions of what they want to do when they get to high school. So it's critical we get them at that point. So I agree. But I, you know, like I said, you have to look at one student at a time, look at the data, and you know, trying to come up with individual solutions for each student. Mr. Engel, yes. do your high school attendance rates include your dual enrollments? Yes. So if a student is, let's say they're, they're enrolled in a dual enrollment, uh, of course, is their whole, we have some students that are in dual enrollment the whole day, mm -hmm. their candidate as present. So we're actually, we had that conversation with Dr. Kane looking forward, I don't want to get too far ahead, but looking at ways that, you know, when, when are students here, if they're taking an online course, are they present? So, you know, we can talk about that at another time, uh, but that's a, that's a good question. Uh, this is the subgroup data, again, trend data. You can see the different, you know, in the elementary schools, kind of reflects the overall data. And then you have the middle school subgroup data as well, by subgroup. And then you have the high school attendance by subgroup. Now, you having said that, Mr. Paluski and I met, and, and I'm sure you're all aware about the 2018 Maryland Report Card. We talked about what we should talk about with attendance, and we felt like it was critical to talk about, you know, the 2018 Maryland Report Card and student attendance, talking about our 7,778 students as of the September 30th count. And as you all, I'm sure, are aware, and, and those of you watching may not be aware, that the state is now looking at chronic absenteeism and that is defined here and it measures and identifies the number of students who are expected to attend school for at least 10 days 
who are absent 10% or more of the school days while enrolled in that school. So for example, uh, the example that's given here on the MSD website says that a student is enrolled for 30 days, they're absent three days, they are chronically absent. Um, so that is something that you know we obviously you know need to address and that kind of changes the, the dynamics of our data and what we're looking at um, and when they do a when they do a scorecard they, they it becomes 15 percent of the total accountability and you can get points uh, correct me if I'm wrong you get points all the way up to 15 points so school can get one point or they can get 15 based on their attendance data mr. Rankle, can I ask you where do family vacations fall into this they, they do they count they count. They count. So even if they're excused. That's right. These are excused. These are just, you know, obviously the only thing would be um, the only code we have is a field trip. But they're here. They're you know they're in school if they're on a field trip, um, and that's the only thing. So if they're on a family vacation or a college visit, um, or you know a death in the family. Now Comar has a number of you know <coughs> excuse codes, and there's there's uh, you know legal absences, but they still count with this. So we're, we're looking at that. We're looking at our vacation days. So we, we've got something that we're going to have some further conversation on. Um, this, is, this is the chronic absenteeism, a percentage of students who were chronically absent in the entire school system. So you see 14% in the entire school system and then 2017. So that number has increased. The number of chronic absenteeism has increased. Now these are, it kind of turns it around, these are the percent of elementary students who are not chronically absent for the 17-18 school year, and I got this from Dave Brown, so I thank him for that. So you can see that number, these students were not chronically absent. So you can, if you want to figure out how many were, then you just obviously you know, take the inverse of that. And these were the secondary students who were not chronically absent for the 17-18 school year. Well, so why do kids miss too much school? Captain Kelly, that's a, spot on with your question. School anxiety is, is a big issue. We, we had a meeting today. My team met with uh, Mr. Paluski and Dr. Kane and talked about some of these issues. Uh, social issues. Schools, uh, kids have, you know, social anxiety. They don't want to come to school. The problem is you start missing school, you don't want to come back to school. And so some, some kids go on home hospital. You know, poor performance, lack of motivation, parents who don't value attendance, school climate, staff morale, and student teacher, student relationships are all, all sort of, you know, <coughs> pieces of this. And how can we improve attendance? Well, we, we heard a lot about Challenge Day and the appreciate the, the comments very much and I think that social emotional learning programs such as Challenge Day are critical to keeping kids in school. We saw a lot of kids that day who, uh, you know, had maybe felt left out, you know, start to feel a little bit more included. <coughs> you know, parent partnerships, working with parents, um, you know, positive school climate, school connectedness, kids <coughs> feeling connected to staff in the building, I think is very important. Even just having one person that they, they can connect with. One adult in the building, I think, is very important. Relationship building with staff, we, we talk a lot about that. So these are ways to improve attendance. Do you so remember, sir, back in, I was on the school improvement team at Kennellan High School, and they were talking at that time, so we're talking 2008, 2009. Uh, some districts were <coughs> uh, offering uh, free iPods to students that stayed in school for more than 45 days. Uh, do you remember that? I do. I do. <laughs> It was like in the inner city. It was like some PG County and then Baltimore City. Yes, they were offering when the service. iPods were really hot back then. Yeah, just to attend school. Just to <coughs> get them to come to school. And some of our, our interventions that I touched on were the you know the parent contact, getting you know having these communications with parents is it, parents are critical. You know the home visits. Our PPWs work tirelessly to you know to to work with the families attendance contracts, <clears throat> the student services teams that meets week, weekly or bi-weekly. We have to take them to court, we take them to court. And then a lot of our school climate anti-bullying initiatives, making kids feel welcome when they walk in the building, we think are important as well. So, that's it, any questions? Are you developing any linkage with the uh, mental health community since you have a high <coughs> percentage of anxiety? You know, that's one of our biggest challenge is the, is the mental health piece. Our counselors, our school counselors are overwhelmed 
and we do have uh, we do have a number of links with our school psychologist and we have linked with we have a lot of resources we have a resource guide that school counselors have that they give to uh, parents you know uh, about as we have, be happy to share that with you but it's it's a long list and we do have a lot of partners uh, we have in-kind space in the school where we have people that come in you know counselors do come into the school and meet with kids they, they come to anchor points and we have well we have three main providers and we have others that we have allowed to you know, come into the building but we we feel sterling ward is our point of contact she does an excellent job if a counselor feels like there's a student <laughs> that might be in need of some mental health services she's the person that they contact and she gets them lined up we have great relationship with you know with courses and corsica and other uh, agencies as well they come here we meet with them and so we have a, a lot of good interaction with them as well okay. thank you but we can always do more yeah. You know, we're, we're, you know, we always want to do more. Those developments. Mr. Engel, the, the one thing I wanted to add is that as we've unpacked this, now that this is part of the Maryland report card, we recognize we've, we've got some work to do. Um, I'd like to recognize Mr. Brown. One of the things that he's supported schools with out of the accountability office is to create a dashboard for schools. So now each school can see how many kids are chronically absent, how many kids are approaching chronically absent, how many students are potentially in danger of being chronically absent. That is a huge resource for schools. And so Ms. Pauls and myself, Superintendent Brad, we started to engage you know, our, our principals and, and how we're monitoring this, how we can intervene potentially a little bit earlier. Uh, the other thing that we have to consider is, is our school calendar. One of the things that we've recognized out of this is half days that are, that are in the calendar. Some parents don't send their kids to school. So there's a lot of factors that, that we're looking at, some which we potentially do have control over and certainly some that, that we do not. But I, I wanted to recognize that because that was a quick support that Mr. Brown put together right away that I think has opened all of our eyes on how we can continue to better monitor this and, and intervene sooner. If you look at uh, the 180 days the kids are in school and then 18 days is 10%, I mean, that's one day every two weeks. That's what it comes down to. On, on what you said, Mr. Paluski, though, I mean, there is that openness on this privacy. You do deal with the principal on specific individuals and how and what they're why why you learned they weren't in school and how you, he can help and the principal can help intervene on that. Yeah, it has to be an individual approach. It really does. Right, right. That's a lot of kids, though. Fourteen percent. It's like a lot. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Right, very eye opening. You. So I'm going to ask you if Ms. Uh, Pauls and Mr. P would come forward for our school monitoring visits presentation. Mr. P, do you need me down there? Mr. P, do you need me down there? Madam Superintendent, you're welcome to be here, there, or anywhere you wish, madam. You're Good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Greg Paluski, uh, Deputy Superintendent, and my colleague. Janet Pauls. E. Janet. And Janet is our Program Director of uh, Teacher and Leadership Development, as well as uh, supervises our, our principals. And of course, you know Dr. King. Uh, the purpose of our monitoring visit presentation this evening uh, is, is multifaceted. Number one is just to share with you the structure that we've put in place over the last year about how we're monitoring as a group of central office leaders. Uh, two is to share some of those results with you uh, and how we use those results for district improvement. Uh, another piece of this is really the, the lens, the leader, looking at leadership practices through the lens of equity. And last is really gather that information and really connect that with some other system initiatives that you'll see in improvement. And really back to aligning this work uh, to the curriculum audit, which is a presentation on which I'll share with you uh, momentarily. So there are three primary objectives to each school monitoring visit that we conduct. So we have 14 schools, we have one alternative program. Uh, and the first piece of that is really to engage in the principal with their school improvement plan and a variety of school data. And I'll go into that in a little bit uh, of detail. The second driver of each monitoring visit is truly our favorite piece, being in classrooms, monitoring teachers, and being engaged with students about what they're learning. 
And the last piece is really engaging with the principal and their leadership team on their data, which we've used through the data-wise improvement process. So each principal has to walk us through that kind of structured protocol on how they're looking at their student data, where they see their biggest gaps, and then what strategies or actions are they taking to be able to close those gaps. So we're monitoring visit structure. So we do this two times a year. Uh, Ms. Pauls, myself, the superintendent, and each of the two, uh, each supervisor attends two visits. So we'll go out in the fall, usually uh, around the middle of October to the end of November, and then we'll go out again in the month of February. And that gives us really a snapshot in time to really see how the school is doing. So with that, each principal and their leadership team provides those three components. There's a data component, a classroom observation component, and the data-wise improvement. So the first step that we do when we go into the school is engage the principal in a variety of data pieces. So what are we looking for? We'll sit down and look at their school improvement plan. Uh, we'll look at some of the, the data points, their intervention uh, data. We'll look at their school schedule. Uh, we'll look at some of our what we call benchmark uh, data pieces uh, where there's snapshots in time in, in different content areas so we can see how they're monitoring that, how they're adjusting uh, to instruction. We look at teacher attendance. Uh, we look at teacher evaluation. We look at um, how the principal's monitoring instruction. What are they learning on a daily basis? Uh, the professional development plan. We'll look at their budget. So we look at a variety of, of different pieces to get a best snapshot of that individual school. With that, we, ask, we have provide them with some reflective questions. And at the end of that, we'll provide them with a written feedback report. And with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mrs. Pauls to really talk about some of the strengths that we're seeing across our district and some of the areas of challenge. Good evening. So we have many more strengths than we have listed here, but we just have um, condensed them into some overall strengths that we have observed in each of the schools. And I'd like to first give kudos to each of the schools for allowing us to visit. It is a lot of work, a lot of compilation of data, and they all have done an excellent job. So overall, whenever we enter the school, we have a, observed a positive school climate, um, beginning when we step into the office, and then our interactions with all of the students, teachers, and every staff member, and even often um, observations and interactions with parents. Um, we know that all folks in the schools and at Central Office are really committed to supporting and improving the learning for all of our students. A lot of data is collected, tons and tons of data, and um, the data, we, I just had some meetings with some principals this week, and they will be adding to the data that they had at the beginning of the school year uh, t for our second visit. We have put some new practices in place, and one is uh, the way we communicate daily student learning objectives. And we did notice in all schools that all classrooms had the posted objectives that were visible to students and that most of them are, are getting to the point of where well, the requirements that we have asked that it explains the what, the how, and the why. So teachers, kudos to teachers, they're doing a great job with that. This is the second year of data-wise implement, um, implementation, and it's going well. Schools have embraced it, and most schools are up to at least step six with this. And one of the things that I've been doing within the past two weeks is getting out to each school individually, and we've been talking through the process, and then I've been asking for how I can support them and providing some additional supports to uh, move schools along in the process so that when we go back out for our second visit, we pretty much see all schools pretty much on the same page. Um, curriculum documents have been improved throughout the summer to support teachers, and we've had every, just about every school, their, their professional development initiatives are aligned with the county initiatives, which is huge. Uh, for vertical articulation and implementation. And we see technology is being used appropriately now. At one point when technology was first implemented, we would see students on games, but now they're using it um, for instructional purposes that really meet um, the objectives of, of a good rounded lesson. Okay. We also, uh, in math classes, saw students using lots of manipulatives. So we know that Mr. Watkins has done a great job with providing those tools and, and making sure that teachers know how to use them. We also have noticed that all schools have a different process in place for monitoring student performance, but they at least have a process. And at this point, they're looking at individual student needs. 
Um, so for example, the SAM stands for uh, Student Achievement Monitoring. And then we have noticed a notable decrease in discipline referrals for the time of year that we visited, which is great. Uh, a lot of the SLOs for teachers and for administrators really focus on the student group performance, really narrowing the focus because overall as a system we're doing well. But until we really start to drill down to the individual student groups that are not performing as well, we won't ever make the gains that we need to. Uh, we have noticed a lot of, of reading and writing in all of the classrooms, but more uh, especially in science because of the new program really calls for the use of science journals. So we've noticed a uh, remarkable improvement with that. We saw lots of small group instruction as we visited schools, differentiated small groups, co-teaching groups, flexible groups. They're using a lot of strategies. I know that um, Ms. Passon has done a lot of professional development with the jigsawing, and we saw that in a lot of the classrooms that we visited, so we know that the professional development is working well. And we saw a lot of schools using equity sticks so that you're not calling on the student with their hand up. They have each student's name on a little craft stick and then they randomly pull their name so each student is responsible for being a part of the classroom discussion. So we saw that in a lot of schools as well. Is that popular with the students? Yes, they are accustomed to it now and they have become pretty astute. They know they need to be listening because they never know when they're gonna be called to stand and deliver. If I may, I have heard a few students say that it gives them anxiety. Really? And that they actually dread that part of class. Um, and this was a few years back. We don't really do it as much in my classes, but I know like more middle school, like eighth grade, that was a big thing. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, I don't want my name picked. Like, so I know that was a thing like back a few years ago. I don't know how kids are with it now. but They, they seem to be better with it now. They yeah. seem to be uh, more accustomed to it because we see it in early elementary and we see it in middle school as yes. well too so um, but we don't want to create any anxiety but we also want them to be a part of the right. instructional process as well right and they probably wouldn't be if they have anxiety <laughs> and they didn't have a stick with their name on it yeah the <laughs> one thing is that you know because of the relationship that teachers have with students they pretty much know their students well enough and if it's a student that has severe anxiety they they truly know how to deal with that and often Teachers will use different strategies where they'll say, okay, this time I picked little Mr. Sid Pender's stick, but the next time I know, um, you know, Mr. Peluski, get ready because you're next. So they give them, uh, you know, a signal that, that they're coming up, so it helps. And, and if they need some support, they have wait time, or they also have, you can phone a friend or you can have someone to help you. So they don't ever leave them hanging, so. Would you explain a little bit about Jigsaw? I'm not... Sure what that yes, is. so jigsawing is if you have a lot of material for um, the students to read and so you might divide them up into four groups. So they often count them off one, two, three, four. They become experts in the materials that they're reading and then they come back and they um, create another set of groups and so you might have a, a one, a two, a three, a four in each of the groups and then those experts are responsible for sharing the information from their specific group. So it takes a shorter amount of time to deliver a lot more material and each of the students that are in that group are responsible for being the expert for the material that they have read. But it, again, it provides the um, collaboration where in their group they all make sure that they know exactly what they're reporting on when they report back out to their other smaller groups. So it works very well. And it engages everybody. Yes, ma'am, and holds them accountable. And um, as usual, though, we still have some challenges, and we know what they are, and we're continuing to work on them, and we know that we have some uh, achievement gaps with all of our student groups, and throughout the, the evening you've heard us talk about that. Um, we're still continuing to embrace the philosophy and the leadership practices, good instructional practices, and we're really looking at those through a lens of equity. Um, today we have, we have um, professional development provided by the Cameo Group, and they have been in our, or they were in our county for the next three days, and I happened to be at um, Mattapique Elementary School today when they were working with that group. And what they're doing is developing a school plan that's aligned just for their school. Teachers are heavily involved in this plan, and um, they really are looking at the, the equity through their school. And it's not something that's rubber stamped for all schools because it's not always appropriate for every school. And um, teachers have embraced it, They've done some equity, equity walks in, within their building, and they have a target for their school, 
and the teachers are the ones who are making the decision as to what direction we should go. And they're small, very small steps, incremental. Um, we have noticed some um, inequities and inconsistencies, and it was uh, great to hear that um, Ms. Miles to, to mention one was that Ken Island High School always had Chesapeake College to come and have a class at their school, and now it's nice to know that Queen Anne's has one at their school too. So those are the types of inequities that we're trying to, um, to, to make sure that the services are offered to all students. And we also have another service, um, Equal Opportunity Schools this year in both of our high schools, where we're really looking at engaging some of the underrepresented, underrepresented students who often are not involved in advanced placement classes. So it's working very well. Um, at the last meeting, each of the um, high schools identified certain students that met the criteria that could function in an AP class, and the schools are now developing a plan, which is varied and, and involves staff participation and involves parent participation to see if these students can um, be successful in higher level classes. So it kind of pushes the child who may otherwise not have um, participated in a higher level class. And then we're really continuing to look at daily rigorous instruction that's aligned with the state standards. Um, also more opportunities for students to respond to higher level questions. Um, math reasoning, yesterday I had a great opportunity to participate in uh, math walkthroughs with Mr. Watkins and his team. And um, overall in the, all of the middle schools we came back with an understanding of what are some next steps to uh, close the gaps in all of the middle schools and then Mr. Watkins will uh, incorporate some of those strategies with the, with the math <coughs> specialists and uh, it was very good, um, very much enjoyed it. Uh, still, as we talked about, students needing mental health and trauma, we do have at least one trauma-based school, Sutlersville Elementary School has done some extensive training with their staff on uh, mental health and, and trauma. And then we are continuing with the professional development with uh, culturally relevant teaching strategies and of course <coughs> uh, continuing to work with our school leadership teams for um, countywide implementation. And so we will start up again in February and get real busy and um, often we visit two schools in one day and sometimes we can only get to one depending on schedules. Uh, we'll continue to monitor the student staff and administrator performance. And again, the beauty of my job is I get to go out and work with administrators often on a one-to-one -one basis, talk about what their needs are, and then I can come back here and serve as the liaison to make sure that the supports are in place that they need. So uh, it's really more of a helping position, and I, and I really do enjoy it. And then um, looking at our professional development, and what our employees need, and then um, analyzing that information from those monitoring visits and moving into our next steps. Dr. Kane, is there anything that you would wish to add? Good evening and thank you. Uh, well, I'm not, a lot has been said already and I'm certainly not going to uh, repeat what has already been said, but I would like to echo uh, both Ms. Pauls and Mr. Paluski in thanking our principals for being so welcoming to us when we come for the visits and, and for being open to, um, um, uh, you know, some, some real important feedback. And it's not just that they are listening attentive to, attentively, they are implementing the suggestions that we offer to them. They really, really, really are working with their staff to ensure that students are getting the best instruction, that the environment is as best as it can be for our students, um, and that students are engaged and that they're engaged in their community. So it's a lot that goes into it. We, we wrap it up here in, in 20 minutes or so, but on any given day, you know, everything breaks loose 
loose in a school, but yet and still the focus is on instruction and ensuring that our students are in a safe and nurturing environment. So uh, we have some very, very skilled administrators and they're doing their yeoman's job to ensure that their teachers and their uh, aspiring leaders are getting what they need to have. And all of that plays a role in ensuring that our students get what they need to have. As you well know, uh, we fared well with the Maryland report cards and, and I'm going to be the first person to say that a standardized test score is not the end all be all. It is a part of how we know that we're doing the right things for children. Um, it is a significant part, but it is a part. It's just one factor into what goes into educating children. And we fare well. Our students um, do what they need to do, and our, uh, our staff, they do what they need to do. Uh, but it all works together along with our community. So I'm just grateful that everybody works together, um, and we triage those emergencies and make sure that everybody gets what they need to have. Uh, there is plenty of work to be done. Uh, I want to thank our administrators for embracing our work around equity. Um, that is significant and it is significant in assuring that we're closing those achievement gaps, whether the gaps be between ethnic groups or students who need different levels of services. We need to make sure that that work continues and they're doing that. Uh, they're working on that data uh, wise improvement process to ensure that we have evidence to uh, substantiate the claims that we make as to whether or not students are learning or not. Um, and, and we work toward making sure that our students are. So there's plenty of work to be done, uh, and they're getting it done, and, and they really deserve a lot of credit uh, along with the community. So if there are other questions that we might be able to answer for you, we certainly are here to do that. Well, this is extremely complicated. That's what I, you know, my experience is with one little 15-year-old, but I mean, and I know the services that are provided to him in, in different areas, and you have this look at the entire system, and there are children, you know, that really need the extra help, and um, really appreciate this, and I know it goes well beyond just the, the central office, but central office needs to get a little credit for it, too. So, we we have a, so a great team that uh, yeah. is there to support schools every single day. You're going to hear from some of them in just a minute. And a very small number of them in your central office doing all this work. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, might as well have our uh, next team come forward that will um, share with you updates for our curriculum management audit. So please come forward. I think that's good. I think they're probably in two. Is that just another hat you have, Mr. Poliski? Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just another hat. Okay. Well, good evening again. For the record, uh, Greg Poliski, uh, Deputy Superintendent. And this next presentation is going to involve um, a variety of individuals, cross-section of our individuals are, are across our school system. And that is one to give you our annual uh, update on our curriculum management audit progress that we've been making. The first thing I want to share with you, and, and certainly uh, for those that, you're, that are new to the board, one is to provide you with an update on the progress of our innovation teams as it relates to um, the findings that came out of the 2016 Curriculum Management Audit. And, and just to be clear why we went through that audit process, if you remember at the time, all of our teachers were just transitioning to a whole new set of standards, a whole new set of curriculum, a whole new set of materials, new assessments. Uh, a new teacher and principal evaluation process. Lots and lots of change that all of our teachers were going through uh, at that particular time, let alone some uh, new technology, as an example, new strategies. So one of the things that we really wanted to see is, so how well are we doing? And with that, uh, what are some areas of focus that we can organize around to move our school system forward? So one such approach to that is what we've referred to as the Innovation Center, and that is a structure of action management teams that are used cross-functionally to work on those audit findings and deliverables. And I'll share with you uh, that in a graphic. The whole notion here of what we're trying to do is really organize and align the system. So what you see really going from left to right, uh, why do we do what we do? So we have to be bound by our district's goals in our strategic plan. Our current ones are listed there on the left. 
That then moves into how those goals are being measured, and then what strategies or actions would we put in place in order to make movement into that area. And then out of that was really born the, the innovation centers, the action management teams that are working on that work. And I think one of the things that was really uh, unique is having the superintendent monitoring visit before this presentation, because I think you're gonna see a lot of commonalities of work that's being done to help address some of those challenges. What this slide really represents is, is what I would refer to as how everyone is involved in this process. And certainly as the superintendent and the board develop goals and priorities for us, then it is the superintendent and certainly her staff that have to carry out those goals and those actions. And one way that we've been doing that is the creation of the Innovation Center, which is really the work how that work translates into action, how that action actually gets implemented, how do we monitor that, and that's what you're gonna see today is an update on that progress and how that really comes back to you for feedback and feedback to us as we continue to move forward. One of the things uh, that really came out of the audit, in the audit, I mean, there's 247 pages there. I mean, that's, it's pretty extensive. But the audit is really based around five strategic areas. Uh, however, what we've done as an organization is we were listening to the needs of the organization and what our individuals and employees felt were organizational pain points. Where do you feel that we need the most attention? And what came out of that were these five themes, organizational effectiveness, early learning and school readiness, curriculum instructional tools and assessment, leadership and professional learning, professional development, monitoring progress and performance. And then what we had our uh, uh, a and S team do, our administrators and supervisors, we took all the audit deliverables and we asked them, which <coughs> of these buckets do you think that best belongs in? And so that's how we've organized um, the audit deliverables into these five teams, really these five themes. I would argue that no matter if you're Queen Anne's County Public Schools, your Clark County uh, Public Schools in Nevada or Billings District in Montana, these are still the five major drivers uh, in any school system that you would want to work on in order to improve teaching and learning. With that, we launched in November of 2016 uh, the Innovation Center. What I'm going to ask then, I'm going to have each of our project managers and process managers. So the Innovation Center team is made up of principals, it's made up of supervisors, and it's made up of teacher specialists, the people that really this work impacts the most. They're going to share with you some of their key highlights, and then they're going to share with you some of the key work that they're doing. So I'll um, have the first innovation team come up. They'll introduce themselves and give you a couple highlights. Good evening. I'm uh, Team One Organizational Effectiveness uh, Project Manager Dan Harding. I'm the Assistant Principal at Kennon High School. Good evening, Scott Higdon, uh, Teacher Specialist, Mount Peak Middle School. Uh, Dr. Kane, Mr. Paluski, board members, uh, we thank you and, and our team thanks you for the opportunity to present uh, kind of a historical uh, little background and then kind of where we are right now and where we're going in the future. So, and hopefully that won't take too long. So, what we've done uh, really since November uh, 2016 to today uh, is we took a look at the curriculum audit and we've revised and updated all organizational charts for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Uh, you'll see those on websites and various publications. We've revised, uh, along with that, revised job descriptions to align with positions. And as you can imagine, as, as long as Queen Anne's County has been you know, around, and there were, there, were, there were some things to do. Uh, we revised school-based budget process and procedures, uh, and we'll continue to do that as, as uh, Mr. Fister's on board and has been. Uh, and now we're really, rev we've revised the district five-year strategic plan. So Mr. Paluski presented the current plan. The plan from two 2019 uh, for the, and the next five years is what we're working on kind of right now. We've established five goals along with uh, Dr. Kane and the executive team. Those goals uh, in the uh, 2019 to 2023 strategic plan are learning accountability results, safety and security, operational effectiveness, human capital, and community partnerships and engagement. So still very similar to the four uh, from the past, but as you can see, uh, one of the notable things is as our second goal, safety and security. Uh, so what we're doing now is we're compiling data points within uh, the county and, and really looking nationwide 
um, so that we can share our strategic plan with the community. Uh, information will be, when it's completed, will be available via website and really to be an interactive resource. So whether you're a, uh, really any taxpayer, any, any person that can access our Queen Anne's County public website will be able to see how we're doing um, and, and how we're measuring up with our five strategic goals. Uh, each strategic goal will have multiple data points for the community. Again, very transparent, very open. Uh, and the curriculum and instruction leaders, uh, really the administrators and supervisors, the curriculum and instruction leaders will assist in gathering the data. And that data will, what we put out there will, could change. Um, so again, I th we think it's in line with the Maryland School Report Card and kind of the transparency and openness there. And uh, we're looking forward to it. And I thought that was going to be the last slide. Are there any questions for uh, our team? I just had one. It, this Maryland report card came out, and like you just answered my one question first was, are they aligned with it? Your program started three years ago, and so did you have to make major adjustments to, I mean, we're doing what, what we're supposed to do. I just don't know how you segued it into <coughs> the Maryland's uh, and Mr. Kuski, if you want to, you want to chime yeah, as well. But I, or Dr. Kane, I, I would say that that our team looked at a comprehensive measure of of goals, came up with with the executive team uh, five strategic goals that we think encompassed uh, the Maryland Report Card, even before we knew it was there. But just what is good teaching and learning, uh, and then really where I think we're going to go in the future uh, and continue to adjust is what information is important and vital to the community to share, so that they they know really where our progress is, both our strengths and our uh, need you know areas that need improvement. Exactly, and and you said it well, Mr. Harding, and, and Mr. Paluski mentioned uh, as he started that there are just some uh, guidelines and just some goals that are um, acceptable, commonplace across the nation that are good to talk about improvement of a school district. What's necessary? What are you going to measure? You've got to measure instruction. You've got to measure teaching and learning. You have to measure professional development. You have to measure uh, your involvement with the community. All of those kinds of things are embedded in this. Uh, we're going to give you a uh, presentation once all of this is said and done because you have to be involved with an improve, you know, approve that uh, strategic plan. But they are doing a, a great job getting the structures in place and, and doing the background work and looking at data to ensure that we have a viable plan to, to submit to you I have I have just on that, one. On that, I'm sorry that okay. for you new and the, back on that old my last thought mm -hmm. it's I'm sure it's really hard because the state comes up with these things and then you have to like massage you've got all this information you guys are doing it and then to massage it and somehow Relate it to what the state is asking you to do, and that's probably going to be hard. I'm glad you've got the you've got the basic work d done to provide that information. Like you said, it's all it's all encompassing. And 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 they have, and they've they've researched other districts, and and now we're going to move into the phase as as Dr. Kane had mentioned. We'll give you a full presentation just on this topic, and allow you to see the measures that that we're you know proposing and then it's really back to that other slide which is now aligning the system now we've got to align school improvement plans we've got to align the district so that we're all kind of pointing in the same direction um, monitoring the work that's important i just want to add and ask a question um, i am grateful that you've added safety and security to this i mean that's a key piece um, that uh, i didn't have enough attention so thank you just in a nutshell human capital what is is that just our our staff is that personnel yeah, staff support? Yes. okay yep. I, did, I didn't know well I, I'm, I'm anxious to see where that where that ends up at I thank you so much thank you thank you team two Good evening, my name is Susan Walbert and I am the um, Project Manager for Innovation Center Team 2, Early Learning and School Readiness. Um, I am the Supervisor of Early Learning, Title I, Title III, and Migrant Education. And here with me is... Good evening, my name is Becky Tubman and I am the Teacher Specialist at Ken Island Elementary School. So we're going to start out with our key accomplishments and Becky will share with you um, where our team started and and then we'll talk about where we are now 
So from the start, we were thrilled that this team was developed to begin with. Um, we believe that by directing our energy and investment into early childhood, that that gives kids the foundation needed in order to succeed academically, in order to graduate from high school, and also to address all gaps and differences immediately rather than later. So we were thrilled to have this team developed from the start. Um, one of the very first accomplishments that I would like to acknowledge that we did not put on here was actually having Susan Walbert become the early childhood supervisor. Um, we were thrilled to have someone that was taking on that those responsibilities um, due to the importance of early childhood. So though she wears many hats, we were very grateful that she was able to add that additional hat to her plate. In addition, we have implemented prior care professional development based upon the kindergarten readiness assess assessment domains. If you are not familiar with the kindergarten readiness assessment, it measures knowledge, skills, and behaviors across four domains. And those domains are mathematics, social foundations, language and literacy, and physical well-being and motor development. So we have, um, Susan really jump-started this. She, um, we've implemented prior care professional development, um, prior care being our different child cares in the area. We also have incorporated parent nights so that our parents have br been brought in in addition to the prior care agencies. And this has allowed everyone to be on the same page and to truly work as a team before the students even enter our school system. In addition, we have implemented parent resources for their child's first school age experience. Um, and what we have found is this is going to be very, very helpful because the resource list outlines everything from child care to health care to mental health, which was mentioned earlier in another presentation, to libraries, um, to different <coughs> supports such as our Family Support Center and Judy Center, um, even um, going as far as providing information on how to contact social services, the Department of Health, et cetera. So this resource we plan on placing on our school website, and this will allow parents, if their students do not qualify for pre-K, they still have support from us and resources that they can pull from to help them while they wait for their child to enter kindergarten. We also have revised our pre-K and kindergarten registration process and our procedures. We've made them much more user friendly so that we are able to gain as much information as possible during registration, but in a time friendly manner for families. And last, we have implemented an early learning instructional look for checklist so that we actually have a checklist for just early learning our pre-K through two as we're going around to different classrooms. Okay. So to talk about our deliverables, we know that um, we are only good as the partnerships we make with the community. Um, that has kind of been echoed tonight, so e even more so with, when building foundations for our students prior to starting school. Um, we are working on creating and implementing um, continuous prior care stakeholder professional development based on those domains. We have had one already this year in, in uh, November. Um, we had about 20 prior care stakeholder partners, and we call them that um, because they, they, are our, they are our biggest partners when it comes to preparing our students and getting them ready for school. Um, we also have, uh, and we, we, uh, speaking about the prior care again, we, will, um, we have three more scheduled. These are professional development that have been developed by um, teachers here in the county. Um, the, the caregivers come in, um, participate in the professional development, and then we are able to have them leave with something tangible that they can go right into their homes or centers and, and um, carry out those strategies that they learn. The other thing that we are trying to do and want to increase is the membership in our Early Childhood Advisory Council. This is a uh, group of community members plus school community that get together and do what they can to support our students and, and, and preparing them for school. We partner with special ed um, and, and because we do work with the same set of people uh, or set of groups that, that, that support our students that have those needs prior to to school starting. 
On the school management side, um, we are required, and this is one of the things that we're looking at this year, is trying to find an oral language assessment that meets the needs of ESSA as well as the Striving Readers Grant. Um, oral language is the biggest trigger um, to, to a predictor, excuse me, of whether or not a child is going to do well in reading and in school. So we are um, we are going we are charged with finding something that measures all of our four-year-old students. So we are in the process of looking at some things and and finding what other counties are using and and have adopted, and um, we will we will continue to work with that. We are also looking at revising our local assessments, um, aligning our kindergarten assessment, which, which is a county-made assessment, a little bit more to the standards. We are looking at how to best utilize KRA data. Our, our currently, our kindergarten teachers uh, give this assessment, and it's given within the first two weeks of school. So we um, want them, even though sometimes it's not really um, they don't hold it as their data because it, it's prior to them even getting um, to school. So we want to make sure that we're utilizing that data to, to the best. Um, it, it does it come back immediately with lots of great information and it allows us to see um, where our students need um, the most attention. And then there's the Kerwin expectations and we're still kind of waiting around to see what's going to happen with Kerwin. Um, but we do know with those expectations will we'll, um, come a lot in the area of early learning. Um, universal pre-K for all is one of the, uh, the driving forces in, in, this, uh, in this commission. So we are in the process of coming up with a plan, um, looking at the situation on what will happen if, um, you know, it, as far as this, this um, being passed and, and how we are going to attack universal pre-K in Queen Anne's County um, with uh, the funds that, that maybe aren't there. Um, so, so we're looking at different plans and different strategies on, on how we'll implement this throughout the next, and it is, it's a 10 year process, but, but we will have to have a starting point. So that's, those are our team deliverables. Any questions for us? No? Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Kane, Mr. Paluski, and board members. For the record, my name is Rob Watkins. I am the supervisor of mathematics, and I am the senior project manager for uh, Team Innovation Standard Team 3, Curriculum and Structural Tools and Assessments. Good evening, and Happy New Year. I'm Bridget Passon. I'm the English Language Arts Supervisor for grades 3 through 12. We will start with the, the, the deliverables we have previously delivered to, to the board. Um, uh, our first uh, major task that we completed was the development and implementation of a comprehensive curriculum management policy, which uh, outlined a process to manage and deliver our curriculum by establishing a structure for curriculum design and implementation. From that, we developed a guide for both supervisors and curriculum writers to help with the important process of effective curriculum writing. So this is an essential resource um, to supervisors and writers. As Mr. Paluski mentioned, there was a lot of newness um, when the curriculum audit was being done, um, and it provided a kind of roadmap for work to do with four of the six uh, new content, supervi or content supervisors being new. This really served as a guide for all of us. Um, it focuses mostly on four major components from planning for curriculum to design to uh, implementation and then evaluation. So a really critical piece that, that we tackled uh, immediately after the policy. We also worked on the creation of the performance indicators uh, for an informal observation uh, to monitor classroom instruction. And we also developed uh, an aligned document to go along with the, the, the uh, Comprehensive Curriculum Management Policy and Procedure Guide uh, called the Program Monitoring Visit Indicators. And we're going to go over those a little bit on the next slide. Uh, finally, we also have uh, previously developed and implemented uh, this school year uh, with the work of Dr. Kane, Mr. Paluski, and all the building principals, a consistent schedule for our elementary schools and for our middle schools. And that was something that we worked on um, this year to create an opportunity so that all, all contents had equitable access, all students had equitable access to all four of the core areas and the special areas. 
So to support the work that we were doing in monitoring our curriculum, we looked at how each supervisor and how each school did it. And admittedly, there were lots and lots of different ways um, about which we did that. Uh, and we all kind of came together, in particular the representatives of this team, to streamline the process and to look at the different tools that were out there and being used um, and create one. Uh, it was mentioned in uh, one of the opportunities for growth from the superintendent monitoring visits that there needs to be more consistency as to how our school leadership is able to observe the curriculum in their schools. And so while CNI is mostly using this tool now, um, we've encouraged our principals to use it. We've seen a lot of principals using it. And we're going to give our principals some feedback um, about how we've used it and show them uh, how we, we Rob created this great Google form in which we capture all the information so that we can share it among the team. So that focuses on four major areas, alignment, engagement, equity, and feedback. Um, there's no evaluation or rating here. Um, there are different uh, bullet points under each, um, and we can be sure to get those to you. Um, but we give both commendations to our programs and both recommendations as well, and then support the principals, the specialists, in, in, in any questions they have going forward developing PD to support um, improvement there. We also worked very hard with our team four in uh, aligning the informal observation template with the formal observation template and getting that both of those forms live and active on our Unify platform. So each of those documents are live forms in our, in our, in our data warehousing system. Um, <clears throat> give a big shout out to Mr. Brown for uh, helping coordinate and help us uh, get the, the, all these pieces and parts in the Unify platform up to run. And he, he and his team have worked endlessly to help us kind of do that. Team 4 is going to go over uh, what exactly we did, we did with this a little bit later in the presentation. The final deliverable that we are currently working on is the development of a high school grading policy and the associated regulations. Recently, um, MSDE passed a, a updated Comar and required each local district to have a written policy and written guidelines, written regulations to support that policy, really to make sure that we're happy, we have consistency across our schools and across the state. We currently have uh, in, in written policy an elementary grading policy and procedures and a middle school grading policy and procedures, but we do not have an active high school grading policy and procedures. With that said, our schools, we feel our schools are still very consistent with their delivery because in each of their handbooks there are consistent um, grading guidelines that each school has been, has been using really since 2010. And uh, our program of study has outlined a lot of the other pieces and components to what our grading process has been. Our task is to take all the different pieces that are already out there and in practice and write them down into a, a comprehensive uh, policy so that uh, it's completely transparent. With regulations to support them as well so that all stakeholders know how we're grading and how we're reporting the work that our students are doing. And that is the current work of Team 3. Are you going to say something about Mr. Brown, too? Is that <laughs> <laughs> He's wonderful. He should just come up. <laughs> Let's just admit that a lot of this wouldn't get done if he wasn't here. It, uh, uh, yes. Good evening. My name is Carrie Mitten. I'm the assistant principal at Sellersville Middle School, and I am the process manager for Innovation Team 4, Leadership and Professional Development. Mrs. Wilhelm was unable to be here this evening. We actually have our connector, uh, another part of our leadership team for Team 4, Kayleen Kovach. And I'm the assistant principal at Mattapique Middle. Can you just say what a connector does? Because everybody might mm -hmm. not know what a connector does. Um, well, in the, in the structure, um, the connector's job is to help communicate with the other teams so we're not duplicating work. And just as Mr. Uh, Watkins said, you know, working with this team and their team on similar types of, we're doing the evaluations and observations, so we're not duplicating, you know, the work and we're working towards the same goal. Thank you. Initially, when we started <coughs> looking at the audit, we saw a lot of commonalities that would go among each of the teams. So that's why I believe Mr. Paluski created the position of a connector. So you connect all the teams in different areas or just the yep. let me just jump in there for so Absolutely. each each of these teams has an individual that is designated as a connector oh, okay. so their job is to is to essentially connect cross-functionally across the team so we're not finding two teams bumping up against maybe the same issue 
And that's what really you're going to see out of Team 3 and Team 4, where the one informal observation ties into the formal observation, which is what this team's working on. So it's a, I think it's provided a lot of communication cross-functionally across the teams. Uh, so we'll just quickly review uh, what we have done so far. And we have uh, developed a school improvement policy. Some of the work that we've done, we've developed the professional development calendar. So that's basically out of the whole school year, the days that we have allotted and, and plugging them in appropriately and the amount of time. Um, and we, we do that each year. And also revising, as we talked about already, the teacher observation and evaluation processes and um, guidelines and procedures for that. Um, and then also we developed a new platform using Unify, and again, um, the last team touched on that as well. So that platform is consistent with both informal and formal, and also our teacher observation and evaluations are now more closely aligned than they were before. And Ms. Mitten will talk a little bit more in depth about this. So some, one of our deliverables and our main deliverable for the past year, and we have presented this information prior, um, was cr working together and creating a new observation evaluation platform. Our team worked closely with the Teachers Association to develop a, a, a document that we both agreed on. So it wasn't a top-down decision, it was a collaborative decision on what indicators were going to be um, on the observation tool as well as the evaluation. It's a new plat uh, platform and it was implemented um, both this year, it was implemented for observations and the mid-year evaluations. We provided training to uh, administrators, both uh, principals as well as supervisors and assistant principals at our ANS meetings as well as assistant principal meetings. But most importantly, we would take that information back and te show the teachers so that the teachers were aware <coughs> that this document um, was replacing the old document. Uh, that We got very good positive feedback from both administrators and teachers. Our next steps are to work with Unify, the platform, um, to develop the end of year evaluations and see how that can be combined with the teacher SLOs, the student growth information, and be able to streamline that process. And then um, in addition to that, this year, uh, our team has started to revise the faculty advisory handbook. The last time that handbook was revised was in 1989. Uh, this is a requirement for the negotiated agreement. Our team has um, started researching other districts as well as using MSDE resources in order to start um, developing some ideas. In addition to that, we are currently looking to develop a professional development plan that meets that audit criteria, and that includes a de professional development policy and a handbook. Um, again, this is another area where we're researching other districts and looking at what MSDE has to offer us um, and providing a, what's key in this one is making sure we are providing professional development to all stakeholders, not just administrators, teachers, but all stakeholders in our school system. Any questions? Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Carol Camp, principal at Graysonville Elementary School. I'm the project manager for Team 5, monitoring progress and performance. And with me I have... Uh, Kevin Kintop, I'm program director for Anchor Points Academy. So our key accomplishments over the past several years are that we collaborated with the Queen Anne's County Education Association to meet the requirements of the more learning less testing act of 2017 
by examining and approving current assessment times for all grade levels. And we were led through that through our connector, who is Dave Brown. And since he's sitting in the back, <laughs> I wanted to mention him. Everybody else has mentioned him, so I wanted to do that too. Today is Dave Brown day. Trying to figure out a way to throw Brad Engel's name in there too, but we, we couldn't do it. Yet. Get to Brad later. <laughs> um, the second thing that we've delivered so far is we uh, created um, and implemented uh, procedures for creating and revising assessments in our county so that there is a way to actually create these, any assessments that we're using across the county or, and even as a guideline for teachers as they create assessments. So it's a way for them to know how to create a good assessment that's going to be effective and give them good information. So we compiled an inventory of all current interventions that we are using here in Queen Anne's County. That was quite an undertaking. Um, we had a lot of help in in compiling it but now we know what we have and what we're using in the county and once we had that then we went ahead and we've created um, a rubric that is to be used when we evaluate new interventions that might be coming into the county so that we have a process for seeing their effectiveness cost effectiveness are we going to get what we want out of them so that rubric has been created and will be used for any new intervention that we're contemplating bringing into the county are you using that for current ones too get to that in just a second right. you're, you're right on it so going forward, um, we have developed a document that will help us to evaluate the effectiveness of the current interventions that were being used. And you know, are they working and are they cost effective? So um, there weren't a lot of uh, models around, so we've kind of developed something that we think will work, and we're getting some feedback from some stakeholder groups right now before we actually roll it out. Um, another deliverable, and one, one of the things that our team is doing is we are, the deliverables that we've been trying to put together, we've been focusing as a whole group on them. We're dividing and conquering <coughs> at this point because we're trying to get a few more things done in a shorter amount of time. So um, another piece that one of our subgroups is going to be looking at is to find a way to create a snapshot of data throughout the school year, system-wide. Um, we get all this data at the end of the year that we're making decisions on and making plans for next year. We're trying to create a way to almost do a cross-section of the system at, no at a November point and at a February point that we can see data from K to 12, academics, attendance, behavior, anything that we might be able to make changes in flight instead of waiting until the end of the year if we see something that's going on. So that's, we are just in the beginning pieces of that stage now of looking at a way to create that uh, cross-section. Another big deliverable for us is to try to investigate an early warning system that would monitor progress of at-risk students, um, examining academics, attendance, as well as behavior data to really focus on at-risk students and then certainly developing plans for them to help them within the school day. And uh, the last, uh, they kind of go together up there. Um, we are going to be creating a policy um, that will be directly addressing our closing of achievement gaps within our subgroups in our system. And then along with that policy then is finding ways to be evaluating that, to be able to identify how we're doing on it, um, to make adjustments on it, and how we can effectively show that we are, the things that we're putting in place are closing those gaps. Any questions? I just said one thing. I know the, I, the IEPs, though, take a mid-year snapshot if necessary. I mean, some of the intervention, reading intervention, those folks have a, I don't know if it's the same with every school. Like a, but a they progress have a, report kind yes, of thing. Right. Yes, right. And then the, the dilemma that we're going to run into and that we have to figure out the best way is at every level and in many different areas, there are points in the year where there are snapshots. They may not all fall at the same point. So it's finding a way to find the good point where we'll be able to get enough data at that moment to help us make a decision because yes the IEPs are done quarterly there's a progress report to send home to parents but a intervention might not get um, an update until possibly a mid-year so we got to find a way to find these cross-sectional times where we can get as much data as possible so we can make whole, de whole decisions across the system okay yeah. I would just like to conclude by thanking all of them. Um, yeah. These leaders, as you can see, there's, there's an enormous amount of leadership that has to take place in order for these things to happen. And I, I can't tell you how much that I appreciate their leadership. 
each and every one of them, each and every one of these teams is moving our school system. They're improving our school system. And it's being led by people that have to implement this. And I think that's really one of the beauties of, of the structure that we've put in place. Um, and with that, we're just going to continue to, to work on the work. Uh, we'll bring you another update probably sometime in May so you can, you know, monitor us, uh, so to speak, uh, and, and give us any feedback um, that you deem appropriate. But I, I really can't thank these professionals enough for their leadership. Are there any, are there any questions that you have of me? Um, well, the other thing I want the public to understand is you heard what their real job is, and so this is all in addition to what they're trying, you know, their, their task is and their job. I, I think it's a great point, Captain Kelly. Um, you, some of these people are, they're leading buildings. Some of these people are leading major content areas, teacher specialists. Everybody has a, a responsibility. And unfortunately, because we're small, um, we have to find ways to to work on the work. And this is just one approach to that, but you're exactly right. Um, it's and, and we've tried to use existing structures of time. So at our ANS, our monthly ANS meeting, we, we've built in time for these teams to meet. Uh, some of the challenges that we find is not everybody can can be there. So we're working through that. We're working through those some of those logistics, but thank you for recognizing that. Um, and would agree as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and you said what I was going to say. Everybody that you heard from tonight has another major responsibility in moving the school district forward. Several students or uh, teachers or employees that they're responsible for leading. And so this work, which is critical to the movement of our district, has to be done and they're doing it. And, and I just want to take a, a, a moment to recognize that um, that work is critical to this school district and we realize how much time it takes for you to get it done so we've you're looking at employees who are working nights and weekends to move the district forward that's in addition to the work that they do every day and also to mr. Paluski for his leadership because he he, he won't uh, include himself in that group but he certainly is he's leading all of that so I want to thank him as well so thank you all for your dedication to that work it's so important I love you all thank you thank you Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, next item on our agenda is the expenditure reports. Mr. Fister. Yes. Thank you, Captain Kelly, members of the board. Um, before you tonight, for information, is the monthly expenditure report. Um, I've reviewed the documents before you, and there's no surprises. Spending seems to be as expected and on par with the same period as last year. However, you will notice uh, that the category of student health services is currently overspent due to the negative amount in the salaries and wages line. This negative uh, amount is directly tied to the support, um, sorry, the support staff scale increase that this board approved um, in September. These budget lines have not been adjusted since we loaded the budget in July and therefore will need to ref and therefore have not been uh, reflecting the increase. We will be bringing you a categorical transfer next month for your approval to bring this category back in balance. I'm s I didn't understand that. So we did not move the money? We have I have not made any budget transfers this year, which right. is a testament to good planning on, you know, on the part of, of the board, you know, and how it put its budget where it needed to be. Uh, so we haven't asked for any categorical transfers at all. We we're more than halfway through the fiscal year. We, the first one coming to you will be next month to rectify this particular situation. Okay. Yes, okay. ma'am. And they just need to be a notification to the commissioners, correct? Once, one, yes, this is a notification, and then you will, of course, approve, and a letter will go over to the commissioners next right. month. Very good. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item is the transportation report. Yes, I am. Uh, we have five substitute bus drivers that have completed all the requirements to uh, be a bus driver in Queen Anne's County, and I'm seeking the approval of Ms. Betty Brooks, Milton Crump, Donna Hicks, and Corey Higdon and Alanda Pack. And then we also have Jennifer Mansfield, who um, has bus 5005, is requesting uh, permission to purchase a new bus because mm -hmm. hers will be at the end of the 15-year lifespan um, coming up, which will require a new PVA. 
So those are the two items that I'm seeking approval for. Okay, what was the bus number? Bus 5005, Jennifer Mansfield. And that bus is how old? It will be 15 years old coming up. Okay, and the members are uh, substitute bus drivers? Yes, that's correct, okay. yes ma'am. So I need a motion to approve the transportation report of five substitute bus drivers and the replacement of bus 5005. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve five um, substitute bus drivers and the purchase of a replacement for bus 5005. <coughs> Ms. Can you come? Any, discussion? Any uh, discussion at all? Okay. Ms. Wright. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Donald? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Ms. O'Connor is absent. I have four in the positive. Um, the motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Transportation report. Thank you. Is passed. Next item on our agenda is field trips. We have Kent Island High School wrestling. HR report. I'm sorry. I skipped the re HR report. The uh, HR report, do I have a motion to approve the HR report as approved in closed session? As presented. As presented. As presented in closed session. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve the HR report as presented in closed session. Do I have any discussion? Ms. Wright. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Ms. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Harper. Yes. Ms. Harlow. Yes. Ms. Morissette. Yes. And Ms. O'Connor is absent. I have four in the affirmative. Mo motion carries. The HR report is approved. Oh, yes, okay. All right, I went to the first wrong thing <laughs> and I kept going. Um, we're missing a one another d agenda item I skipped. It's the school board work session discussion. Um, we had a discussion in um, closed session on um, the uh, on the change of times for the work sessions. We had a lot of discussion on it. Then we realized um, by the help of, of Ms. Harlow that it is in our, actually in our handbook that the work sessions are to start at a certain time. So we were looking at changing the time. So what <coughs> I need is a motion to change the time to start it at a, a different time um, at 5 o'clock as opposed to 11 in the handbook. And uh, so does anyone want to give a motion for that? I, I actually would like to have some open discussion before we, will, we have After a we have a motion on the, on the table. Well, I don't, well, somebody can second it if you want. Does anyone but have? I don't. Do the motion and do the second and then call a discussion. That, that's what I just yeah. said. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Somebody else can second it. Do you want to just make a motion? To, we can make a, a simple motion to change the times, and then we can have a discussion and agree on the times. I'll make a motion to change to the 5 p.m. hour rather than the 11 a.m. So is there a second to that motion? I'll second it so we can have a discussion. Okay. We have a motion and a second to change the work session times to 5 p.m. Um, is there any discussion? Sorry. I just think that by limiting our times and putting it in the handbook you know future boards that that was done back in 2015 when I was president and we just left it at that if we just say that the work session times will be approved by the board at that time it allows a little more leniency where someone may have trouble here and somebody may have trouble there I think pigeonholing it to a certain time doesn't give us a leeway that's just well, my opinion. that's not allowed well, because when we make a change to a public meeting, we have to announce that change in the prior public meeting a month ahead of time. Um, I'm not in favor of these evening meetings because I've sat through two budget cycles and we're getting ready to start a third. And they're weekly meetings. They're very intense. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of dedication, and a lot of attention. And I'm not sure a 5 to 8 o'clock at night hour is in everyone's best interest. Um, we also have to keep in mind that this will require a change to our handbook. An amendment to our handbook requires four votes, a supermajority. Right. Okay, here's what I want to clarify. In this particular motion, we are talking about changing it, and we will follow on with changing 
the handbook. We don't have to hand handbook change with four. If we make this change now, we'll make the change and then we'll follow on with a handbook change. Um, and I understand what you're saying, um, Tammy, but we, I did not plan on putting a time. When we go to uh, alter the handbook, we wouldn't put a time in because every board is going to have a different idea based on their work schedules. So I don't want to get pigeonholed into another time either. We, we did that. We didn't have it before, and apparently in the 2015 handbook change, we actually put a time in there. So I would like to, and I'll clarify my, um, the motion. The, the motion is to change the work sessions for this year, the work sessions for two, five to eight. Um, and that is, usually, that is the work session that is held on the third Wednesday of the month. When but we get an okay on that, if we I get an okay on that, we will that change way. the handbook. I think the handbook has to change to reflect any change in time. I'll no. call on Darren. I think that's not true. Let me clarify. You don't need to ask for legal. Yeah, I do. checked on this. Actually, yes, I would like a rendition. Okay, well, okay. but I checked on this. We us. Excuse okay. me, Sharon, I'm speaking. No, no, uh, we fine. have Bring we it. have many changes in the handbook that are awaiting approval. And we're not following the handbook in certain areas. And when we had the handbook, we, there are other areas we weren't following. So I'm trying to adjust the handbook, but that doesn't mean we don't move ahead because we have work sessions coming up soon. Well, we're still following the 2015 current handbook. Yes. In one area. And I'm not. not aware that we're not following that handbook. Could you help me out with yes. what well, area we we're Yes, well, we haven't in the okay, last well, couple we're years. We're getting out of the scope okay, I'm just of saying okay. we have not um, followed it in every way. And we have major changes going on in the handbook. So okay. Darren, we, can we get a legal uh, advice on this, please? The deal is, can we just uh, do one meeting and not the handbook? And we can do the handbook later. We have it sitting there ready to I, be okay. adjusted. Be, but you're uh, talking approved. about next week's meeting, correct? Yes, I am, right. I'm talking about changing it right now. Uh, for the record, Darren Burns, Board Council. Um, there's a few sort of converging things you need to keep in mind. Um, you do want to move cautiously with changing a published expected schedule in the sense that you create an expectation um, you have to be it, it is not a policy or regulation it's your handbook but your handbook is treated as if as if it's a policy mm -hmm. and because this system has chosen to publish it and in fact publish it along with rules about the limits on when it can be changed it is much like any other policy that you have and under without boring everyone with the details under the Accardi doctrine and other legal principles you're at your peril whenever you try to move outside your established policies or rules. There's always a process for doing that. And in fact, your handbook gives you that process. I think without getting into anything else you're doing under your handbook or not doing pursuant to your handbook, if your handbook says that your regular monthly meetings are held at a certain time and that your work sessions are held at a certain time, that's what you've put out to the public. That's what's in your handbook. And I would not recommend that you change that, sort of picking the pieces you want to change around the overall procedure. And I think it's on page 89 of your handbook that says it requires four votes in the affirmative to change your handbook. And I think if you could simply say, well, we'll, we'll ignore that and make a change to whatever we do, oh, and then we'll go back and fix the handbook to match that, you're going down a slippery slope. So if you're asking my opinion, I would, I would advise against it. I also think there's another, as I said, there's a few things converging. It is common practice for boards to follow a meeting schedule somewhat congruent with their academic calendar. So the public often expects a calendar to match that July to June time frame for schools. It's the same for boards. And, and I, I understand there's election cycles, there's fiscal cycles, there's calendar cycles, but the public has an expectation of a student academic calendar following that, that certain path. And most boards will publish a meeting schedule in advance of a year and then periodically change it. But for whatever reason, your handbook locks them in more. So in answer to your question, could you, could you change one meeting time? Things come up. But we you, have, you we have published the, um, and the schedule. We don't put the times in. We it, never have it, put the times in. Uh, actually, up until December or so, you had a, a, a number of months in okay. a row published. Right. All right. I, I'm sorry. And it is not I'm published right that. now, so therefore your handbook tells the public what you're doing. But for one one meeting, we could adjust the 
We could adjust it. And then we could. And, you, and according to your handbook, you're supposed to provide notice in advance to the public that you plan to do that. Okay. Okay, so we could change a meeting like yes. for the 16th and then take it. We are missing a member, so we, you know, we couldn't do four votes. But you would not have provided as part of your published agenda for this meeting your intent to do that. And I think Ms. We did. I think Ms. Harlow. We did. It's in my agenda. Oh, I didn't know agenda. there was a specific. I saw the agenda thing, but the I didn't know there was a says specific. School board request. work session, new start times. Um, help me out with anybody's thoughts. But oh, was that why. for the? But that was for that for the next meeting. Oh, it's this meeting. No, 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 no. I mean for your next okay. meeting. No, but we haven't okay. published an agenda for that yet. Just know it's a work session. We are giving a, a week's notice for anyone who would like to. We are we are trying to be accommodating to members who have jobs during the day. I, I, not, I, I mean, it, that's our that's the that's what the end game is about. Yeah, and that's not and that's not my place to comment on. I, that, I, no, so. no, no. I'm not asking you to. I'm and, just and giving the what reason I behind it. Care, um, Tammy, I wanted to hear some support for this. My concern is I work at night. <laughs> I think we have a couple of other members who work at night. So it's going to be a conflict for me more often than not. It's going to p be a burden for me. I can't speak for anyone else. Okay. So I'll just put that out there. I, I, I have to understand though, are we allowed to take a vote to just change the time on that particular meeting? We do this, we're, on it, we're having a meeting right now that is, that is not the first Wednesday according to our manual right. and you and you took the time to mm -hmm. well in advance I don't I, I believe when did you set this meeting up because it was in light of the holiday was one of the right. one of the considerations it was fairly fairly far in advance of this meeting that you made that decision it was the 19th and that's and that's a good practice you did that mm -hmm. I, I I don't think you're again things come up that require those changes but I think if you were to wholesale change your work sessions, whether they're, and I'm not talking about your a la carte budget workshop work sessions, because those sometimes get set, you know, within a certain period of time. I'm talking about the way you say in your handbook, your third Wednesdays will be at a certain time. If one of those meetings you have something that comes up, I mean, and things could happen that would require you to make that change as far in advance as possible would be my recommendation for doing so. But that would not alter, I think, your overall schedule because your overall schedule sets up a certain expectation that you have this first Wednesday, third Wednesday, evening meeting, day meeting approach. And again, I, I'm, I, all I can do is give you my best advice. I'd recommend against a wholesale change like that going around what your handbook says, which is it requires four votes to change your handbook. Okay. That's and the best I'll I can just say. also add, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight meetings, including this one, scheduled every week for eight weeks. And we have our evening meeting the first Wednesday of the month. So that particular week will be two evening meetings. Um, and then we have various other meetings after that. My understanding is the handbook would need to be amended prior to making an across the board change. Right, that's how I understand from you. And I do like okay. Darren's process of going by a school, you know, the okay. school calendar, because that's will, what we've we done will, in the past. We will, we will, I will, re I would, uh, I will. Um, we have a mo but no, if you have, have a, a good reason a to do it for the next Wednesday, take your vote. You no, can it, put it. it. We have a motion and a second. We have a motion and a second. We finish that off. We have to okay, finish have that finish discussion, the discussion first. And my, uh, my thought is we, we put this on an agenda on the 16th and uh, for the next work session. We hold it in accordance with the, um, the, the handbook and we talk about it, we take a vote, we take a vote to change the um, handbook on that date. Okay, if can, we I, need to. That's can I offer I a solution for this? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the handbook, it only talks about the work session on that, that, one, that Wednesday of every month, correct? Correct. The rest of the meetings for this month are, and, and the extra meetings in, in, in February are just budget meetings. Can those budget meetings be from five to eight well, again, okay, but, but that's they not are, how it's been printed and uh, oh, posted. No, but, but, let me finish, please. That it, all the work sessions will be okay. at 11 o'clock okay. is on the schedule. But just th that schedule can be altered as we are giving enough time. But those sessions are not in our handbook. As okay. it takes four, can you give me a second? 
as it takes four members to change the handbook, okay, we may not have that, but can we agree that those other sessions be from five to eight to accommodate people who do work during the day? I, I have no problem with that. Like I said, I have a real problem with that because our work sessions often run over, our budgets work sessions often run over, and it's a whole lot of work, and I'm not sure anybody's prepared to do that late at night, but okay. I'm just saying, in that's my preference. In oh. your, our understanding from what you said, uh, Mr. Burns, if we stick with what it says in the, in the handbook, which is the 16th, is our normal third Wednesday meeting. We hold that in the, in the, at 11 o'clock like the handbook says. But we're adding extra budget work sessions on here, which are not included in the handbook. There is, and that's and when I heard that, that's on why I wanted schedule. to come up Can with the actual. Can we set a time for those that may vary from? He, but here, they're here's on what, the schedule that we've the, circulated. And, that, and, and, your, and your schedule you circulate is a separate issue that, mm -hmm. and a policy thing you should talk about. I'm talking but, about the 23rd. But I want you to know what's in, your, what's in your handbook, which, and it, as, as Member Harper had said, it's dated back a few years now, so it, it's what's been there. It does say. Business meetings are held, this is on page 29, business meetings are held as specified below unless notice to the contrary is given at a previous business meeting, which would be your once a month evening meeting. And it says first Wednesday of each month and third Wednesday of each month for a work session as needed. But then there is another paragraph, which I had forgotten. Work sessions as needed are held as specified below unless notice to the contrary is given at a previous business meeting third Wednesday of each month at 11 a.m., and then it says two budget work sessions in January. So that's, to some extent, what drives your, your scheduling in January. But as you've said, you can, you can have more. You can do more. And I, at any times that we deem necessary, because it's not stipulated the time frame. For the budget work sessions. Hand. Right. That is correct. Thank okay. you for the clarification. That's why I want to clarify. Okay, would you like to amend your... Um, no, um, we have a motion. And she it has can been she, I didn't. she set the motion, oh, yeah, so she, she can did. amend her motion if she wants to, right, Parliamentarian? No, we have to. We you make an amendment, then you have to vote on the amendment, and then on the amended or motion. Or withdraw. Can't you or withdraw your motion? Aaron, you can withdraw redraw. your motion. Mr. Burns says we can withdraw the motion. We can. And you can also do what you said. Amend. Harper, you can also have whoever proposed it make an amendment. Right. Okay. okay. But you have to vote. So what it's coming down to is it next Wednesday, the meeting will be at 11 o'clock. Right. We can't change that. But we that's can't, not normal. We can't, for now. we can't change that. The subsequent meetings, we can with a vote um, because, and it won't require, it would only require the majority of the, of the people here if we take that vote now. So I'll just withdraw the motion and we'll and make a new motion. 11 a.m. Do you want to withdraw the motion for the work sessions? For the pre for the prior twenty third and the third. The subsequent ones. Yes. You want to withdraw the whole motion? Let's withdraw the whole motion. You want to make a motion? We'll just do January for now. Twenty third and thirtieth. But we're talking about something. <coughs> well, I don't know, maybe 23rd, at least the 23rd. So uh, I will make a motion to change the times of the school, school board budget work sessions on January 23rd and January, tentatively, the January 30th meetings to 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Yeah, it's not changing. Basically, it's uh, just uh, setting excuse the me, time. There's, it's this not, is a motion. There's no, discussion it, after someone has seconded. I'll second you. Now, now discussion. My thought is, you're, we are not changing. We don't have the time set. Basically, we, there, no, it's not in the manual. So I'm speaking to my motion. <coughs> okay. The fact that those two sessions are not included in our handbook, we can change them. They are, though. There was now, two he, January he meetings just, for budget. Mr. Right? Burns just described to us that the time frame is only scheduled for the for the one meeting of Wednesday, the third Wednesday of the month at 11 o'clock. Any subsequent meetings that we have as far as work sessions or budget sessions, we can set the times as long as we are doing it at a meeting, which is this qualifies. Am I correct? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Thank you. And we'll notify the public of that change. That. So there has been a motion, a second, any other discussion? Discussion, the motion, okay, the motion and a second. 
is to start the school board work sessions on January 23rd and January 30th at 5 o'clock. Any other discussion? Ms. Wright? Board members, please respond when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? No. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Ms. O'Connor is absent. I have three in the positive. The motion carries. Okay, so the, the school board work session, budget work session on January 23rd and January 30th start at 5 o'clock. January 16th is at 11. January 16th is the usual time at 11 o'clock in accordance with the handbook. Okay, we'll go back to item number 9.04, field trips. Uh, Ken Island High School Wrestling to Stephen Decatur High School. January 18th through 19th. Do I have a motion to approve that field trip? Is there anyone here that would like to speak to those field trips? Either one of them, Mr. Pender? No, I can give you some little bit of background. The, the wrestling um, tournament um, starts around um, 1.30 in the afternoon on that Friday, and then the last round starts at 9.30 at night. So basically they will get back to the hotel at 11 and then report back to Stephen Decatur at uh, 7.45 in the morning. Motion. Okay. So I need a motion to approve the Ken Island Wrestling trip to Stephen Decatur High School January 18 and 19. After the motion and a second, we'll have discussion. Make a motion to accept the Ken Island High School Wrestling team to travel to Stephen Decatur on January 18th and 19th, 2019. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? No. Ms. Wright? Well, Barbara, please respond when I call your name. Kevin Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Uh, yes. Ms. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Mossett? Yes. Ms. O'Connor is absent. I have four in the affirmative. The motion carries. Okay, the Island Wrestling field trip to Stephen Decatur High School is approved. We have another one up here, the Queen Anne's County High School Band to Norfolk State University on April 25th to April 26th. Do I have a motion to approve that field trip? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the band for Queen Anne's County High School to go to Norfolk State University April 25th through 26th. Is there any discussion? Any background, Mr. Pender? Uh, defer that to Mr. Yeah, this is on uh, the uh, adjudication festival that they'll be participating in. Uh, I know Mr. Wright uh, participates in, the, in a lot of these um, in, in well recognized um, of, of our Queen Anne's County High School band. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any more discussion? Mrs. Wright? Well, members, please respond when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Ms. O'Connor is absent. I have four in the affirmative. The motion carries. So the Queen Anne's County High School band trip to Norfolk State University is approved. May I make a recommendation that in future meetings that we just lump them and do them all at one time, unless there's something that we really feel that there's a need to have it described to us? I mean, these, they're, they're pretty standard. Do. We so. have been doing okay. them in lumps. Okay. Okay. Okay, I don't mind. Um, I think because the Ken Island wrestling one was a two nighter, I mean an overnighter, okay. that that deserved a little extra. Okay. But we the band have is overnight them too, right? The band both, the, both the of them are overnights, yeah. Yeah. right? Okay. Right. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is Citizen Advisory Council. Ms. Harlow is going to give us an update. I am going to do that, but before I move forward on that, I'm going to make a motion that we request that our policy committee meet once a month on a regular basis. Um, throughout the year so that we can start catching up our policies and start moving forward a little bit um, more well, than Ms. we have been. I, we, you have to talk to me about agenda items ahead of time. That's, we're not doing It's not an agenda, agenda item. item. That's a motion, oh. Ms. Okay. Kelly. I'm, I'm in the middle of another agenda item right now. So Citizen Advisory Council, can you advise us on that, the update on that, please? Well, we're waiting to develop a policy, mm -hmm. and we have very little interest from the public. So we need to put it back out again and try to spark some more interest and um, get a policy in place for them to proceed under. Okay. Do you um, have any idea, I mean, any inkling of why there's been so little interest in it? I don't know. Um, 
We mentioned it three or four months in a row in this meeting. It's out on the website for probably three months. We rarely get um, feedback um, from the general public about our policies for whatever reason there is no. not. No, I'm just talking, I'm talking about the, I'm talking oh, about I, the Citizen I, Advisory I Council. I apologize about that. No, the Citizen Advisory no. Council. No, we've not had, um, the staff has not had involvement of that at the request of the prior board. Can we not allow them to have some some feedback into this and, and be a part of it? We had any Miss Wright's been receiving names? Have we had many people interested? No, I shared those with Miss Wright. There's about ten, exactly. but two are duplicates. Exactly. Um, so I think that we do need to request that the community call Miss Wright if they're interested in serving on our citizens advisory committee. It's a committee that most counties in Maryland have. Yes. It's independent of the board, but there should be a board liaison or perhaps two that does work with them, but does not dictate to them. They need a policy to work under, so we need to start thinking about getting that done. Um, we kind of want to make sure it doesn't take on a world of its own and yet we don't want to tell them we don't want them to feel uncomfortable in their meetings or if they have a concern or they have a community concern that they can't come to us that's what a citizens advisory committee well, my is. question is what's wrong with eight eight seems like a large number to me because we'll only end up with two oh. mr poliski is this something that a policy could be worked on under one of the teams i understand they were working Doing well, that's what the committee does. That's why I asked. It's setting a policy for a citizen's advisory, or is that out of the scope of that? Mm -mm. Seeing that you don't want it in the hands of the board member. Well, it's it's going to, what we would do is we could start a draft of one. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, if we don't already have something in Queen Anne's County already started for us to revise, we look to other districts and we find out what their policies look like. We go to the state board to find out if, there, if there's guidance, if there's legislation around all of those things. So we could pull together a draft and then it would go to the policy committee mm -hmm. anyway. Okay. So if there was, and board members sit on the policy committee as it would be appropriate. So. Um, and in the meantime, we could ask for, again, put it out to the public asking for anyone to sit on our citizens advisory sure. committee. We should put it back on the website again. Okay. Sort of I mean, I, I would, on the website again. I would encourage. That's yeah. fine. And, and, yeah. and the, what we need to tell them, too, if they do call, is that we're in the middle of creating a policy, right. so it's not going to start up right away. Right. So, yeah. We had given them calls. that update back in the fall, okay. that it was sort of on hold because we needed an operating policy for them. I don't think it's a good idea to start a committee without one. Right. Yeah, so. I, I agree. Okay. And we can have we, a benchmark. Can this also be put on um, bulletins that go out weekly from schools? I know I get emails from the two schools my children are at every week letting me know what's going on in the school, but there's also attached flyers to that. Can it be conveyed to parents that way as well? Yep. Good idea. Okay. That's a good Maybe idea. Maybe get more, more. Very good ideas. Thank you. So we'll make that happen. Surely. Okay. Uh, we'll just, who were you listing as the uh, person to contact Ms. Hilo? Jackie was before. Okay. Here's so a, a um, email address that they can email mm -hmm. to. Gotcha. Okay. okay. So it doesn't all fill up yours, right? It, was it falls a, into its own email right, that way right. I can determine exactly how many I have. So it'll fall into its own email. Right. Okay, great. Okay, okay. okay. superintendent, we'll but, take that for action. I'll get to that when I get. I will uh, take care of your um, when it's time. Okay, I'll take care of your your uh, motion that you came up with policies. We'll talk about that at at the end, like we usually do. Okay, future meetings and events. Me, community, sorry, community, community participation. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Is there anyone else who would like to speak as, as a part of our public comment? Thank you. Thank you. Future meetings and events, January 16th, state. The school board budget work session at 11, January 23rd, the budget work session at 5, January 30th, board budget work session at 5, if it's needed, it's tentative in case we haven't finished um, all of our budget work. February 6th is a regular school board meeting. Uh, superintendent will present her recommended budget then. 
And we will hold, we plan to have a budget work session February 13th and February 20th and we will hold off on the times on those until we've made a decision. Well, can we list them as tentative, or, or do you, No, Dr. I'm just going to leave it like that with You'll no leave time. leave them? No time. Okay. Now, are there any other motions oh, I, that... I, I do. I, I would like to entertain a motion because the February 13th meeting is on the heels of the February 6th, and seeing that it is not the third Wednesday of the month, I'd like to make a motion to make February 13th, 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock, why are we having a February 13th meeting? Do I know? Yes, it's on yeah. here. It's yeah, I'm looking for my list. Because we need uh, more, and Kate, because we needed more time with the budget. Well, I know that, but why isn't it on a Wednesday? Oh, it is a Wednesday. It, it is, is a Wednesday, yes. but it is not the third Wednesday of the month. Therefore, we could change the time to five to eight, long as Neither we are discussing. Neither is the 16th or the 23rd. The budget meetings are generally once a week until Dr. Kane creates her budget and presents it to the community. Then she presents it to the commissioners, and then we come back and start having budget meetings again. We have these. We ran out of time yeah. last year. We had to shove a whole lot of meetings in a very short period of time. We don't want to do that again. So these meetings are very important to get us ahead of the game. Yeah. Yeah. If we get ahead of the game and she has her information she needs from us and we've gone through the motion and we don't need all the meetings then we can cancel them we may have to add more meetings after her presentation Which depending on the what funding decisions but we don't want to give any of these up do no, you Ms. Ms. Harlow I concur with everything that you said my prior term on this board for four years that exactly what we did we had meetings in February so since the February 13th meeting is not on the third Wednesday of the month my motion is to have that meeting from five to eight. We are giving notice. Actually, somebody has to second it. In We're order basically for me to have doing what we denied doing 15 no. minutes ago, no. changing all these meetings. Excuse me. There's a motion on the floor, February 13th, school board budget work session to be held starting at five. Do I have a second? A second. Now I may speak to my motion. Thank you very much, Mrs. Morissette. Because the February 13th is a week after our February 6th meeting, it is not enough time to give to the public a notice that we would be changing the time. Therefore, I made the motion, out of a courtesy for other board members who work during the day, that that meeting, February 13th in that month, would be from 5 to 8. February 20th is the third Wednesday of the month. That one, as per our handbook, is held at 11 o'clock. Thank you for allowing me to speak to my motion. Is there any other discussion on the It's motion? going to get very confusing having different times for meetings. It's not at all conducive to my business that I run. Any other discussion on the motion? The motion is to make February 13th school board budget work session begin at 5 o'clock. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? No. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Ms. O'Connor is absent. I have four in the affirmative. The motion carries. Okay, the school board budget work session on February 13th is at 5 o'clock. And we'll get that published, please, so the public, know, public knows. Okay, Ms. Harlow, you had a motion you wanted to make? I make a motion that we request that the policy committee start meeting once a month we have about seven policies that are sitting out for read none of them have been edited none of them have been discussed um, one of them is a total cut and paste nightmare and um, we got more work done in the past week trying to get the policy that was originally on this agenda to the approval stage than we've gotten done since so, um, probably September, late September. So, Mo I, I, excuse, I'm sorry, Captain Kelly. I'm sorry, you made the motion to have a policy committee, committee meeting, meeting once monthly. a month. Mo monthly. monthly. Is there a second to that motion? I'm sorry, I forgot. Yes, you have to okay. have a motion and a second in order to have discussion. Okay, discussion and you want to discuss. I'm sorry, we didn't do that in the right order. Oh, that's all right, I'm done. Okay. Any other discussion on it? Well, we haven't had anybody second it yet. Yes, we did. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Morissette. Yes, you did. 
I don't think that the, we should be deciding on that. That's something that the policy committee can be deciding among themselves and just reporting back to us. We don't need to make people have a meeting. So especially since they're volunteers. So it's not in our jurisdiction to tell you when to set a meeting. Um, what, would you talk about the policy committee for me just a minute? Well, I, I can speak to it, and then I'm going to have Mr. Farley uh, come behind me if I leave anything out. So the policy committee generally is a committee of the board. Um, it is not necessarily a policy that, I mean, a, a committee where, well, the board really doesn't set times for committees to begin with. Uh, there's generally someone who takes the lead in a policy, in a committee, just like it does in the policy committee, and they decide when they're going to meet. Um, they could decide that they want to meet quarterly. They could decide that they want to meet monthly. However it is that they make their decisions, that's generally the way that it happens. Uh, what generally happens is the policies are drafted by some central office committee, and then they go to the policy committee. Um, there is a process, if you recall, that we have. It's uh, uh, sort of a, uh, a graphic to show you the different stages and what happens at each one of the stages. Uh, that had been um, reviewed several times over you know, the, the fall. And and um, we moved on, made sure that every part of that was taken care of, reviewed by legal. The issue came when we needed to work on the formatting. And it appears to me that the policy committee really has been tied up in formatting. We had moved all of the policies uh, before this school board. There had been no intent to edit for content. All of the issues have always been at this point with the formatting. And it appears that the policy committee is still um, out on the exact uh, format. They are still doing work on the format. Mr. Farley, did you want to speak to anything else? Only to say that um, we've struggled with identifying the editing conventions in a way that met everyone's expectations. The, our discussions really haven't been about content of late. They have been about format. Um, so numbering protocols, page numbers, font sizes, font type justification, those are the things we've really been working on, and we need to move this thing forward. Yeah. But may I interject that that policy was edited in September. No, November, I'm sorry. And there were several very crucial comments in that editing that and the policy committee is the executive team and two board members just to clarify that um, that should have then come to the board where there were questions as to are we going to make it a regulation policy and a development policy because there was verbiage to do so. In other areas of that policy, there was verbiage to only call it a development policy. There was a question as to which mission we're going to follow, the board's mission or the school's mission. They're exactly the same. But we need, as a board, to decide are we going to say we're following the school board's mission or are we following the school system's mission? And on page three, if we say it, we're following the board's mission, we need to say that on page nine as well. It needs to be consistent. These are some of the things that have come to us since we got the edited document. We had not seen the edited document prior to it being on the agenda last week and the first document that was posted is not the document that was there today. Okay, so okay, point of order. So, so point yeah. of order, Captain yeah. Kelly. Yeah. This is getting out of the scope of what we're talking about. We're talking about appointing meetings. Okay. So we're not talking about the scope of the work. Right. We're talking about the scope of the meetings that we are asking these people to have extra meetings. I don't feel that this board well, needs to Well, we've never determined how often it would meet. Well, it doesn't need a vote from the board. It just needs a clarification by the policy committee when it will meet. So right now the motion is that you are asking for us to tell the policy committee they have to meet at least once a month. So and that's the, the motion. And we're in the middle of discussion. And my input to the discussion is we need to make sure that we move out on this particular policy, especially the policy development policy. The committee meets sometime soon and get it. 
resolved. No, we need to do that. No, the we board, do not. Yes. The way policies work. Yes, this, this the board, is now the board's responsibility. Excuse me, it is not the board's responsibility. I checked. The board is responsible for receiving the policy and voting on it and looking at it and adding comments and ad making questions. We have never sat down and worked on a policy as a group, as a board. It's not in our job description. That's what the staff does. That's what I just you've got agree. board input. I if you want agree. our input to it, you, we've got two people, you and okay, Ms. O'Connor okay. on, we're on out the of, committee. We're out of order. I'm just saying this is the situation and we don't want to tell them what to do, but as a board, we can advise them and we're going nowhere. We need to make sure but we are presented with the best policy that the committee can bring forward. So no, we we're can not. Look at it and there's, vote. there's. Excuse me. Okay, that's my a plethora of errors still in this. The policy committee will take. We care concur of that. with that. We do. We absolutely concur with that. Care. But that policy has got to come out of the policy committee. No more are we all going to have subpar and, work. And, and, and here's we, the thing: once so, you you've changed your your document it needs to be posted to the community for them to read for them to see we when we approve a policy need to be approving a policy that needs nothing else done to it when you attach that policy to, to the agenda and approve it in a meeting like tonight that is your historical record of what that policy looked like in this meeting and next year, if you go to your policy chart and you find there's a different version of that policy on your policy chart, we have a problem. Okay. They have to be no, exactly the disagree. same. We, we don't disagree. disagree at all. No, we have. Um, we don't the, disagree with you at all. It's, may I finish? Well, I want the committee to fix it. All the edits, all that, and get it back to us as soon as possible. And it comes back not for approval, but it comes back to go out for the first read. We'll do that again. And we'll get the community input to what was just just produced, but ben, and then we, we will go ahead and vote. Some of these decisions are board decisions. Are but we going to call it? We agree. If the committee policy. comes back we asking agree. for a board's decision, then we will talk about it. But that's not why there. I hoped to okay. get it on the work session, uh, and next we will week. put it on a work session because I hate to bother the whole community with this. And with I'll just add that most counties committee meets monthly. Okay. Well, well then that is something that you all something. need to decide. Right. You're in the committee, so you need to decide that. Okay, so we had a motion to, um, you made I'll a motion. I'll withdraw it. I'll withdraw, withdraw it. Okay. Motion withdrawn. Fine with that. Okay. But we are, con we totally concur with you that that policy needs to be, has to have more work. Evidenced by all of our emails to each other, we all agree it needs to have work on it. And it needs to be done soon because, and exponentially, ex best possible time well, it's frame. It's been edited since the 27th of November okay. and nothing ever happened till okay. last week. Okay, well, well, I have we to tell you direction. that two of us just got on this board and that's the first time we had read it. I, and it, and I certainly believe We that. agree with you that it needs more work. So we would like the policy to committee to go back and redo it and, and bring it back to us and then we'll put it out for our first week. We are, this is transparency in government. I, I agree. We are, we are all Mr. in the same Farley. page with this. Well, you're saying exactly what I emailed you guys today. Exactly. That, Mr. Farley, is M Meredith on editing yet? Meredith is Kenton? Mm -hmm. um, she is on editing, but she was waiting for approval of the uh, editing conventions. Gotcha. Which come out of the regulation. Right. So please, you all discuss it as a committee. I'd like to move on. Anything else for the? Okay, do I have a motion to adjourn? adjourn? No, we have to go into closed session. Okay. As per. That's right, sorry. Okay, we're gonna be moving into closed session. Do I? I got it. Mr. Burns, do I reread the closed mm -hmm. session no. article? Adjourn, open, go into closed. Yes. yes. Yeah. Do you make a motion to close? Yes. I, go into, no. I make a motion to go into closed session. Same close. Make adjourn. a motion to go in this closed session. Adjourn. I'll make the motion. Open. No, you can't. Excuse me. Yes. Okay, go ahead. I move we go into closed session to discuss a personnel matter, board process, and consult with council. So, a second. Uh, we have a motion and a second to go into closed session to discuss administrative personnel matter, board process, and consult with council. Any discussion? Well, members, please respond when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Ms. O'Connor is absent. I have four in the affirmative motion to carry.
Okay, we're going to close session. We'll be back when we're finished. I need a motion to close the open session. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to close the open session for January the 9th. Uh, any discussion? Mrs. Wright? Well, members, please if I want to call your name. Kathy Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Woodset? Yes. Ms. Bertana is absent. I have one the affirmative. Okay, meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.